Again, good morning everyone. Uh, may we ask everyone to please rise for the invocation and the Philippine National Anthem. Please take your seats. Again, thank you again to everyone for making it, notwithstanding the rains. So we welcome you to the Kalesha, Kalesha Symposium. With the title, The Rational, the Relational Approach and Constitutional Jurisprudence as Tools in the Search for Justice. So we'd like to officially kick off the symposium by calling on our Vice President for Higher Education of the Ateneo de Manila University, our very own Dr. Maria Lucy Vilches. morning, I bring the freshness of the traffic and the rains this morning. Uh, I hope you're all well. It's nice to see all of you here, despite the chaos of the world outside. 
So I greet Dr. Joy Hofilenia, Dean of the Ateneo Law School, other administrators and faculty members of the Ateneo Law School, distinguished guests from the law profession and other law schools in the Philippines and overseas. Uh, chiefly from overseas, we have our guests from the University of Malaga, Universidad Nova de Lisboa, and the University College Dublin. Faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's always a good morning, even if it rains. It is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you, first to Ateneo de Manila Loyola campus, and second to this symposium titled The Relational Approach and Constitutional Jurisprudence as Tools in the Search for Justice, which is under the Erasmus-supported project called CALESA, Capacity Building for Legal and Social Advancement in the Philippines. What captivated me in the title of the symposium is the idea of a relational approach in the search for justice. It actually reminded me of a scripture passage, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, and I quote, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or more witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, end of quote. So I see that even during those ancient times, some kind of dispute resolution was already being practiced a lot of our behavior is governed by relational rules, whether articulated or not. I would think from a non-legal mind like mine, I thought I'd say from an illegal mind, but from a non-legal mind like mine, that a relational approach to justice would make human interaction better understood beyond legal rules and regulations. So let us see how that goes as translated into the symposium discussions today. I'd like to welcome especially our resource persons in this symposium. First, we acknowledge Maria Salas Porras, a, thank you, a doctor of law and senior lecturer at the Department of Labor Law and Social Security at the University of Malaga. Welcome. We shall listen to her share some advances on the relational justice approach and the added value that this can bring to the legal world in general and to alternative dispute resolution in particular. Second one I would like to acknowledge is Jose Jao Abrantes. Thank you, sir. A full professor of, at the Nova Universite Lisbon School of Law and since April 2023, the president of the Portuguese Constitutional Court. His talk is on human rights and constitutional jurisprudence. I'd also like to welcome our reactors of the presentations. Teodoro Alejandro Calao, thank you. Um, four, Teodoro Alejandro Calao, four, let me get it right. Professor of law at the Ateneo de Manila University. And Cedric Candelaria, our very own chief of office, research and publications and linkages office of the Philippine Judicial Academy and professor of law at Ateneo de Manila University. The symposium also gives space and time for an enlightening exchange of insights at the open forum among participants. I hope you will all find this event an engaging one. Take time to enjoy each other's company and make friends. You will find that it is friendships that sustain interests and further collaboration. As many Filipinos would know, ACALESA, although it's an acronym for your event, Akalesa in itself, in our own context in the Philippines, is a horse-drawn carriage reminiscent of Spanish times, which we can still actually see pacing unhurriedly in the streets of old Manila. So may I just end these welcome remarks by saying I wish you 
your Kalesa ride today may be a great one despite the weather. Thank you very much and enjoy the seat. Thank you very much, Dr. Vilches, our Vice President for Higher Education of the Ateneo de Manila University. So let's now move to, uh, to our first speaker of the day, Dr. Maria Salas Porras, who is a Doctor in Law and Senior Lecturer at the Department of Labor, Law, and Social Security, University of Malaga, Spain, where she attends lessons at levels of degree, master, and PhD. Her research activity has made her travel to Brazil, Switzerland, Portugal, Malta, Italy, Bulgaria, and Romania. Her main lines of research are migration, public employment policies, social economy, European labor law, and comparative labor law. She is currently director of the master's degree in law and prosecution of the University of Malaga, academic secretary of the University Institute for Research on Justice, Cooperation, and services of general interest of the University of Malaga, and also a member of the Spanish Association of Labor Law and Social Security, the Spanish Association for Occupational Safety and Health, and also the European Social Security Network and the Visayas Arbitration Center here in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's all give a warm round of applause to welcome Dr. Maria Salas Porras. Good morning, everybody. Such a wonderful presentation, so amazing that I want to listen my, her, my myself speaking. So thank you very much. Um, it's important for me to start this um, presentation. Even it's my duty to um, congratulate ourselves, yourself. Um, obviously, you are wonderful. Um, a wonderful people. Your country is marvelous, really. It's raining a lot, uh, even from the point of view of a Spanish person, but amazing, your nature, your character. Thank you very much for your welcome. And obviously, thank you very much for the organization of this meeting. It's not only Professor de Torres, who is in charge of this project, but it's also Ateneo of Manila, who is to be thanked for. So thank you very much. And now, let's go to start with the presentation. If you allow me, I have uh, 60 minutes, if I am not wrong, but I don't want to borrow you a lot. So we will start with this, uh, as you can see here. Let me check if this works. Oh, here, yeah. Here we are. Um, just for clarifying a bit the presentation, I have two, two scopes, two main, two main aims, if you allow me to, to use this expression. The first one is to present you all this um, relational justice approach, which is, let's say, very, a very new approach regarding to justice, the idea of justice. And the second scope of this presentation is to, to ask for your help. I'm going to explain myself better. This is an experimental approach and we want to open um, space for reflection, for you to help us to highlight its strength, but also to correct its weaknesses. So, I want that this presentation be no a monologue. I want um, a reflection, a collective reflection, if you allow me this, okay? So, this is the content. As you can see here, the presentation has been built up upon four blocks of contents. The first one is just to explain to you a bit the origins of this approach, just to help you to understand which is or what are behind my backgrounds. The second blog is based on um, presenting the main components of the approach, the objectives, the scopes, and the main elements. Um, the third blog is uh, addressed to, let's say, to present the added value, if there is any, 
of this approach. And the final block is addressed to put in practical this approach to help you to understand how this should work, if it is work, okay? So let's go to start. The first one, let's go to speak about origins, the origins of the relational justice approach. As you can imagine, this approach um, is the product of a um, long lasting research career. Uh, we are a um, team of more or less seven persons in Malaga who are working in the relational justice approach. Some of them are here with you, the other ones are in my country because several reasons, some of them related with illnesses and so on and so on. But um, during several years we have been working in this. We have publications, we have books, we have papers, uh, we have been attending international and even national seminars, and we have been discussing this idea. What is the reason? Why should we have started speaking about this relational justice approach? Well, as I can imagine, um, you all know that modernity, and especially after modernity, the idea of justice suffered a sort of weakness, was unable to cover the huge amount of ideological and cultural ideas that opened suddenly. The um, natural law was replaced by rational natural law that was based in different ways of understanding the social contract. I'm thinking in philosophers as, for example, Locke, Hobbes. I'm thinking also in Kant. I'm thinking in Habermas, in Rawls. For them, the nature, the nature of the social contract was very plurivocal, were not univocal. So there was many reasons, many theories that explains, that try to explain the origin of justice. So at the end, it was so difficult for the idea of justice to cover all this amount of ideas that it became weak, not so strong as the beginning. Justice was considered as an outcome and nothing else than this. And this is very important because the first question that we have to put in our mind is, is, this, is it possible to obtain a fair outcome when nobody, when nothing assures us that was justice at the beginning? Is this possible? Can we obtain a fair result when nobody assures that there has been justice in our interests, in our motives? This question and other ones that you can see in, this, in the slide there, is not, there were ideas that come from different philosophers, but some of them, as for example Habermas and Rawls, gave an answer and tell us, well, Perhaps justice can be identified with the idea of equity. So, justice equal equity, full stop. Is that enough? This is one of our questions as a group, as a, as a researcher, as a researching group. Now, suddenly we take it to account that perhaps they were focusing, philosophers were focusing in um, rational procedure. So we can guarantee a rational procedure and at the end we obtain this fair result. That means that human beings cannot alter this procedure. That means that in a relationship we cannot pursue justice because we want. It's something that is imposed. Is there any place in which justice can be rebuilt, can be founded, can be seek? Um, and what happens if at the beginning we 
the human being that are in a relationship. We don't want justice as a result, as an outcome, as an output. The answer given by the philosopher were not enough, at least not for us. So we have to focus in different ideas, different ideological and the different philosophers. And what we find at the end of all these theories was the same. Marx, Dunlop, even Parsons, and then we have um, Habermas. For all of them, human beings were conditioned, were determined by social relationships, as if they never were able to broken, to change, to decide their own destinies. Is this possible in the legal way of speaking? And we found a very interesting philosopher, not the philosopher, was the sociologist, Donati. Pier Paolo Donati comes from the Italian school of thoughts. And for him, there was a new way of representing social relationships. And he distinguishes between human and social. And when he speaks about human, he discovers three semantics, which were very interesting for us. Why? Because along these three semantics, we can discover something new. The possibility for human beings to be owner of their destinies. They can create. Marx, Dunlop, Habermas, for all of them, the society determines, limits human beings. But for Donati, society was a room, was a space for human beings to be new. It's like the um, arises, emergence, not an idea of urgency, no, emergence in the idea of arising something, something new appears. And this new can be created by human beings according to their beliefs, according to their behaviors, according to their interests. And this is important. This is important because in ADR, alternative dispute resolutions, what we need is absolutely this, the possibility of rebuild the human relationship that has been broken. So it's a decision. You have had a problem with your colleague, with your mate, and then you want to rebuild this relationship that has been broken, that has been spoiled. I want to. Perhaps the other person wants to also. So it's our motive, it's our interest. We want to rebuild. According to Habermas, according to Marx, according to Dunlop, according to Parsons, this was not possible because it was society who was controlled your own destiny. Their philosophers idea, I mean. Now, according to Donati, this was an option if you want to. So I was saying this was three semantics, which was very important for us. The first one was related with the idea of um, thinking in the relationship as a um, refero, Latin term, refero. Um, this means that in a relationship, I found myself in you. Which that mean? That means that I have conscience of who I am because I have you in front of me. I can feel myself reflect in you. I have conscious what I want because I have you in front of me. I can look through your eyes. I can find myself in you. I have a reference in the other person. I know that I am a person because I have a person in front of me. The second semantic used by Donati is related with the idea of um, a structural semantic, which is the meaning of this. This means that in human relationships, we settle, we establish bounds, dependence between one and the other. So um, this is easy to see in, legal, in the legal field. We understand um, 
contracts, we understand duties, obligations, we understand the idea of rights, but in social relationships, do we establish bonds also? Yeah, sure. Because sometimes you have compromise with people. When you shake hands, what you are doing is to give in the good faith, your good faith to the other. This is the meaning of shaking hands. According to ancient Romans, the goddess of faith lives in the palm of your hands. That means that when we shake hands, what we are doing is exchanging our faith goodness. That means that you have a compromise with the other one. This is the structural meaning of the relational approach. And the third semantic, the last one, is related with the idea of um, generative semantic. The idea of generative means that the reality has no full meaning in itself, but you can build, you can construct in every time, in each time, you can construct this reality, which is very important, because this means that nothing is fully done. You have to do it continuously, redoing. It's not incomplete. It's complete in itself, but it's something new, open to the new. These three ideas were very important for us, because we want that relational justice um, become a um, practical approach that help us to look for justice in a specific place. Where? In the human relationship, which is the unique place that allow us as human beings to build up justice. And this has to do with the added value of this approach, the possibility that offer us to look for justice in a specific and concrete room in a concrete place. It's not an abstract idea of justice, in a concrete and specific idea of justice. And these help us to answer all these questions. Justice can be pursued, justice can be refused, justice can be revoked, justice can be looked for. This is the main idea I want to express but I want to go deeper to help you to understand what I'm trying to present today. Okay. Now, this is, let me check only one thing. Oh. Oh. Wait. No working? Okay, okay. This is the previous one, right? Let me check, only a moment, because it's not. I'm not sure if this was. Okay, this was the next one. Um, when Pier Paolo Donati starts writing about this relational sociology, offer us these three semantics and we take them. Um, when we start studying Pier Paolo Donati, what we found is that several philosophers were following the same paths. Ian McNeil, for example, Cabrelli, for example, and then our leader, if you allow to use me this word, which is Professor Antonio Marque, that he were unable to come here because he felt really ill after COVID pandemic. So for all these authors, well, um, the most important thing of the relational approach, generally speaking, is the possibility to focus on the human part of the relationship, not only on the transaction. When we speak and when we focus specifically on the transactions in the law world, when we focus specifically on the transaction, we lose important things. As for example, 
behaviors and the reasons of these behaviors, your interests, your motives, the motto of your relationship. This is the most important thing according to this new approach, the relational approach. In ADR, in alternative dispute resolution, to focus on motives is main and important. Why? Because you look for another way of solving problems, and that means that you have strong reasons for doing this. So your reasons, your motives, your interests are the more important part of this relationship. For them, for the relational contractual philosophers, motives, behaviors, interests are the most important thing. Know the transaction. And now allow me to speak a bit about labor law. The long-lasting nature of labor law allows us to go deeper in this research. Why? Because when we have short transaction, for example, sell my house, buy a house, full stop, one step, that's everything. But when we, have, uh, when we hire somebody for working in our company, this is not only one step. This is the beginning of a long way, long, long way. Several times, a lot of years, 40, 50, 30 years, long lasting duration. This is important because during this relationship, legal but also social relationship, we have the possibility of use the relational approach because the motives, the interests are very important. Each day when you wake up, you have a different way of seeing the world, of seeing your goals, of seeing your partner, your children, your siblings. So this is important thing. Every day, your motives, every day, your believings, your behavior are under changes. And this is important because at the end, it's going to be reflected in your relationship with others, even with your boss, even with your workmate. Now, these other philosophers that we were speaking of were very interested in motives, were very interested in how to recover justice if it is or has been loosened in a um, relationship, in a work relationship, in a naval relationship, or in a social relationship, that at the end, what we find under what sustain the labor relationship is a social relationship also. If you are an employee or you are the employer, what you have, the bottom, is a social relationship with other human beings. So this was the important thing for us. These were the philosophers we have been followed. And this is what I've, I bring to you from Europe, even if you want from Malaga. The relational justice approach. Let's go to see the main elements for you to understand what I'm speaking of. What is? the main scope of this approach, I have said before, the look for justice. Only nothing else and nothing more than this. It is possible to look for justice in a um, human relationship? And the second question, how can we do that? Well, through an analysis. What are we going to analyze in a human relationship? The three semantics we were speaking before. According to Pierpaolo Donati, it is possible to distinguish in a relationship three elements. The first one, two human beings that are referring each other. The second one, the bones that have been created through the relationship. And number three, the new reality that arise from our relationship. Allow me to explain it a bit better. First one, these 
analysis allows us to, okay, it's like, let me put you this example. It's like, okay, have you ever been uh, in the cinema? How many of you? Just for wondering, okay, good, no, too much people. And then, um, the second question, in a 3D film, three-dimension film, have you ever been there? Yes? Do you have enough money to buy these glasses, strange and ugly glasses? Have, do you, can you buy them? Yes, right? Me, no, but perhaps you, yes. Why do you use these glasses? Why? Which is the main reason of this? To what? For being more attractive or what? Why? Come on, people, wake up. For? Why do you use these glasses? For seeing in three dimensions, right? So you put together three colors, which is green or green and red, uh, I suppose, or blue and red. I don't know how this works in this uh, part of the world, but yes, green and, and red, and then you put them together, and then your mind is confused, and then you see, wow, the star is coming. No? Is the complexity that uh, your, your mind is looking for. If you take off your glasses, you cannot see in three dimensions. What you see is in plain one. So it's not so realistic as when you use these glasses. It's the same here. We have to split, we have to break the relationship. We have to separate these three elements for being able to distinguish them but we cannot understand the relationship if we don't put together the three elements. Reciprocity, which means that I know that I am a person, I am a human being because I have another one in front of me. And then we have the bond that have, I have created with the other. And then I have the new reality which has been created in our relationship because, because, when you start a relationship with other, on another human being, there is something new. It's not anymore you and me, it's we. And the we is different from you and me. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? When you start a relationship, a new reality arises, something different, which is created for every relationship, as has nothing to do with the other one. If I have a relationship with Professor Abrantes, it's very different with Professor Lucia Arawet, and it's different from my husband. Three realities. I am myself, Professor Abrantes in himself, Lucia in herself. But in our relationship, there is a reality, a new one, different of everything. These are the three elements that we have to analyze when we want to apply the relational justice approach. Let's go to focus in the first one. Institutionality means structural, according to the relational sociology approach. Institutionality means structural. Now, let me make you a question. Um, you are in the first year, second year, third year of law? Which year? First? Oh my God. You have a lot of to do, babies, yes. For, oh. Better, much, yes. Uh, okay, for all of you, now let me put you this question. Um, imagine Imagine an employer and employee, the people from the first year. Do you understand what I'm saying? Employer and employee. Good. <laughs> Let me put you in this way. Employer and employee. Good. Try to imagine, try to imagine, please, which is the meaning of institutionality when we speak and when we refer, when we observe 
unemployment relationship. What can be institutionality? If I say that is the bound, what is the bound in an employment relationship that you can see, you can touch, you can feel the bound? What is structural in employment relationship? What do you have to do to start the employment relationship? What do you have to do to sign Wow. First year people know the answer. Fourth year people doesn't know that. So you are a big problem, babies. <laughs> so yes, the contract. This is the first thing that you have to do to sign the contract. Normally by written, right? Yes. This is institutionality. This is what you can feel, touch. You feel attached to the other, to the employer or to the employee, because you have signed the contract. The contract express, materialize the bound. Okay? Uh, now, in Philippines, do you have collective agreements? Yes. yes. This is institutionality. Do you understand why? Because it has been settled in this document, your rights, your duties, what the salary, the, the um, working times, holidays, vacancies, days off, rest, leave, so on, so on, so on. And what about your constitution, the Philippine constitution? Does the Philippine constitution belong to the institutionality axis? What do you think? Yes, because it established and settled your obligations, your duties, your rights, and so on, so on, so on. Good. Um, do you have a worker's statute or something similar? Worker's statute, I mean, rights and duties for employees. Do you have something like this? People from the fourth year, please. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Institutionality, do you understand? Really, good. Now, now let's go to move to the second axis, this one. Sociality. I was saying that the big problem with the previous philosophers was that they, they believe that social relationships determine human beings. You can do nothing to change this. You start and you born in the specific social or um, society and you cannot change the society. So is that the society controls your thoughts, your behaviors, your feelings, your, your motives, your interests. According to the new philosophy, no. I strongly recommend you to read Luigino Bruni. It's Italian, but he writes into English also. Also you can learn Italian, which is very interesting. Um, Luigino Bruni is an interesting author. He uh, is an um, economist. Is a, he is an economist. And he writes about something very interesting. Um, let me explain in a very quick way. That means an accurately way. But for him, there are three levels of reciprocity. Now, what this re reciprocity means? Um, the possibility, the capability, the ability that you have to be an um, entrepreneur. Let me allow, uh, allow me to explain it better. To do as you think is the best way of doing things. Re reciprocity for him is the capability, the ability that you have of being autonomous, not to leave you dry by what other people think, but what is your own feelings, your things, your interests, your motives. That means being an entrepreneur. It's not only the faculty or the possibility to create a business, but the possibility to be original. For example, Santa Teresa de Calcutta, Jesus, 
Mahatma Gandhi, José Rizal. Do you understand what I'm saying? People who are creative, who doesn't allow to be thrive of by other people's thoughts, but has their own thoughts, their own motives, because they believe that these are important to pursue. Okay? So, according to Luigino Bruni, we have three levels of reciprocity. Zero, which means that you don't move. One, that means that you move, but only if you take any kind of advantage if you do this. Second level, that means that, well, you move if some of your friends, perhaps your family, move also. And number three, this is the most important one. Very few people have this degree of reciprocity and means that you move alone. Is that you have the possibility of doing things because you can imagine and you feel that these are fair scopes to follow. And I was thinking, for example, in your national hero, Jose Rizal. He believed that was the aim, the scope he was pursuing was an important one. And he just kept doing it. Okay? This is Reciprocity level three, not so much people have it, only few people in each society, in, and this has been scientifically proved. The vast majority of us, mortal people, we have zero, one, or two, but three, very few people. How many national heroes have you had? How many? More or less. One, two, three. No more than the fingers of my hand, right? Good. Now, reciprocity is very important in human relationships because determine your motives, your interests, your behavior. According to Luigino Bruni, sociality, sociality is something new, is something open incomplete in the meaning of be open to the new, continuously creating, because it depends on your interest, on your level of reciprocity. Let me put you an example of society. So, sorry, sociality. Your Supreme Court, Jeffrey, is here, and perhaps he can offer us some ideas of new pronunciation of your Supreme Court. When, you, when your Supreme Court speaks, what is she doing? What do you think? People from the fourth year, even Jeffrey. What is she doing? When the Supreme Court makes a pronouncement, it doesn't matter, it's important, it's not important, it's like a, a counsel, it's an advice, it's an act. What is this? Sorry? It's like a light in a dark tunnel and show you where the way is. You must go to this place, to this way. Please go on. Right? This is society. sociality. It means that we are continuously creating, we are continuously open. When a new problem arises, we have new answers to give to this new problem, and the answer, perhaps, is totally different from a previous one, because society has changed, the mind has changed, the values has changed, the principles has changed, the behavior has changed. For example, in Spain. In Spain, we have nowadays this problem of um, Humanizing animals. Let me explain in uh, with uh, putting in a simple example. Ooh, our people is taking dogs in. How did you say this into English? Uh, I cannot find the word. Uh, she'll. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, are you crazy? <laughs> Excuse me. What are you doing, ma'am? With a dog inside the, this thing. 
This is what we are doing right now. Humanizing animals. It's not that you mistreated them. It's, you, it's that you are treated them as they were human beings. Abortion is an option in our country for 16 years old girls. I'm absolutely against off. But it's my point of view. It's not that I'm trying to convince you. No, allow me to do. But it's like I see that things are a bit crazy because you are treating dogs as if they were human beings. Uh, you are able to kill an unborn baby. There is a sort of contradiction because we are speaking of different lives. A human life, an animal life. So it's like, well, a lot of irony, hypocrisy, sarcasm. I don't know how to say this. But the question is that we are under pressure. We, our thoughts are changing, continuously changing. Okay, because values, principles, behaviors, motives are changing. This means sociality. Okay, the society, society is open to the newness, continuously open because our relationships are changing continuously. At the same time, our minds, at the same time, our motives. Reciprocity, this is the, the last axis, but the most important ones, because it's the motto of everything. You behave as you feel, as you want, as your motive push you to do. So, these are the three elements that we analyze in each human relationship. Institutionality, sociality, and reciprocity. These are the 3D glasses. These are the 3D glasses. And with these glasses, what we do is to focus on the specific relationship. In our case, labor relationship. When there is a problem, we put on the glasses, look at the relationship, and try to distinguish the three elements for detecting the problem. Where is the problem? In which of these three axes can we find the problem, the gap of justice? Okay? Now, let's go. Now again, I have done it again. Okay. This is the explanation in a summarized way for you to understand, but we haven't spoken about it. And then I want to move to the added value of the relational justice approach in comparison with other ideas of justice. Let's say the most common idea of justice. The first one. This is a honorific teleology idea of justice. It came from Aristotle, people from the first year, because people from the fourth year probably has forgotten it. Aristotle, who was this guy? Oh my God. Have you ever, have you ever listened speak about Aristotle? Good. Who was he? That comes from? Good. Point for you. Yes, and this honorific teleology approach was about, no, too much for this hour. Yes, I know. Okay, what he was saying was more or less, um, you must be given according to your honors, to your values, to your principles. The most important ones are going to be re rewarded more. But there is a problem in, in this, in this um, approach, which is, who is in charge of defining what are the most important values in each society? Who is in charge of this? Because this is very important. According to Aristotle and Socrates, according to this, was the democracy the citizens, the Greek citizens, meeting in an assembly, they have the possibility of deciding what were the most important values in each society. 
But for our world, this is crazy because we are living in a globalized world. So it would must be like a global assembly speaking everybody. How many people are you in here? We are 40 million Spanish people. And you? A lot of more, yes, I know it. So this would be very difficult for us to achieve. So this idea of Aristotle is a very important, very interesting one, but very difficult one because it's unattachable. It's impossible for us to follow this idea. It's very abstract. So it has been kept in the um, ideal level of thoughts, not in the practical one. Now, if we move to the second idea, which is the distributive and commutative, the idea of justice that comes from Ulpian, Ulpiano for Latin people, I suppose that you know who was this guy, no, too much for you. Ulpian, no? Okay, this was an ancient Roman, ancient Roman, ancient Roman um, legislator, let's say in this way, just for understanding each other, and he wrote the most important legal thoughts of the ancient Rome. For according to Ulpiano, distributive and commutative justice means that you have to give the other one what he or she deserves according to the transaction that has been done or the harm that he or she has suffered. Okay, that means distributive to share richness and commutative. That means if you have suffered any hurt, you are going to be, yeah, like, uh, let's say, a compensation justice. Well, Again, the same problem. Who is in the church of evaluate, validate all these ideas? This is very difficult to do. Each country, which in philosophers, which is idea, which is cultural thoughts, ideological, so on, so on. Again, in the ideal level of thoughts. If we move a bit forward, we have social justice. As you, I don't know, I, I know that in your constitution, social justice has been mentioned several times, but do you know where this idea comes from? No. A Jesuit, Luigi Tapparelli, 1843, and he were sucking ideas from Santo Tomas Aquino. Do you know who was good? So, after this, then we have the, uh, uh, social party in Uni United Kingdom, and then we have the um, um, encyclica uh, Quadragesimo Anno from uh, uh, the Pope Pius uh, XI, and he wrote, he wrote in this encyclica, he wrote what is the meaning of social justice according to Luigi Tapparelli, according to Santo Tomas Aquino. According to him, was the distance between poor people or needy people and rich people and the limit, the limit that should be uh, accepted in a social justice society. Okay, so this is a limit of the distance between rich and needy. This is the idea of social justice, the general one, the basic one. A bit forward, restorative justice. This is an interesting concept. It's appeared in 1977. The um, pioneer of this um, um, restorative justice was um, Albert, Arbel Eglash was the short name, Eglash, E-G-L-A-S-H. Um, according to this uh, philosopher, restorative justice was a sort of um, yeah, restitution of the victims, but according to the idea of the victim. What? Yes, what I'm saying. According to the victim. So there were some several uh, meetings between the victims and the offenders, and the victims have the possibility of express themselves, tell the offenders how they feel after the offense, and look for a compensation. But this is compensation or revenge. Wow, which is this interesting difference between these two words, right? So let me not be very confident about restorative justice. And then we have transitional justice. Transitional justice comes from the 2000 and was um, pushed by 
this philosopher, Ruti, Ruti Telpi, which is very interesting, and then the United uh, Nations Organization took this concept from an interesting report in 2004, and according to this uh, transitional justice, um, is addressed to an um, okay, collective, collective forgiveness um, in cases of massive transpassing of human rights is a way of meeting a sort of um, agreement of pardon, agreement of forgiveness. This is transitional justice, more or less. And the last one, which is capability theory of justice, I am sure that you know this better than me. It comes from Amartya Sen, but specifically Marta Nussbaum in 19, 1984 was the first time that he, she wrote about this capability theory of justice, but it's very incomplete, if you allow me to express in this way, because it presents a very a not very detailed idea of justice, set on steps of dignity uh, that has not been contrasted, not compared, so it's like a not very sustainable idea of justice. And, and at the end, we have this relational justice approach. Um, what is, at the end of all this, what is the added value of this approach that is practical? That you put it, you can put it in practice whenever you want. And I'm going to help you to, this, to, to do this right now. As you can see there, um, your time of suffering is finishing. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm finishing, so don't worry. Um, I have been writing there several articles of your own constitution. And these are examples of your constitution where you can find ideas of these ideas of justice. Um, the most repeated one according to my own interpretation, obviously I can be, and I should be obviously mistaken, but according to me, the most um, repeated is the social justice idea. You can find them almost along all your constitution, speaking about cooperatives, speaking about housing policy, speaking about uh, labor policy, speaking about social security policy. Um, at the preamble and the, these other parts, what you can find is an explanation, a presentation of your values. You as the Philippine, uh, the Philippine country, the Philippine citizen, okay? So, um, I think I don't have plenty of time, but I can come back if you want to do, to do this game. But for me, it's more interesting, move forward, just for, for, for helping you to understand and to put into practice the relational justice approach, okay? And now, um, these are the three examples, these three. Um, Professor Francisco Vigo, who is seated there, with the white jacket there, um, he has rice in the hand. So, according to Francisco Vigo, which is professor at the University of Malaga, colleague and friend of mine, we have been in several occasions in a summer school in Madrid, speaking about these um, practical examples of relational justice approach. And, and uh, in, the, in this exchanging with other students, um, University of Madrid and from other countries, um, we have perfection, if you allow me to use this term, these examples. So let's go to move to the first one. The first one is related with um, ethical trade and how can we guarantee um, labor rights in these supply chains all around the world. It's not only from companies settled in Spain or in the Philippines, no. All around the world, multinationals can be labor rights guarantee in these multinationals? Is this possible? Well, remember the three elements of the relational justice approach. First one, institutionality. Contracts, collectives, agreements, constitutions, and norms as for example, workers institutes, and so on, so on, so on. Well, in ethical trade and supply chains, we have nothing. 
In our world, there's nothing similar to a world constitution. Well, we tried it in an European level, but it was a total mistake. Do you know this? Yes. In 2011, uh, the vast majority of European countries say, constitution, no thanks, which was like a total lockdown. So around the world, do we have a constitution? People from the fourth grade, no, nothing similar, no. Do we have collective agreements in multinational Normally? No. Normally? No. What do we have? Contracts. Employment contracts. The vast majority of them individually agree, which means nothing. Nothing. Who is a strong part in this relationship? Obviously the employer, right? No, the employee. Good. So, institutionality in this example, it's failing, it's missing. There is a huge gap because we have no bounds, we have no rules, nothing settles rules, nothing settles obligations, duties, rights, nothing, unless small employment contracts, individually negotiated, agree. So who is the strong part? The employer. Who imposes the conditions? Who? The employer. Obviously, no labor rights. Not at all. There is a justice, and there is a gap of justice. Can be easily identified. Can be rebuilt. It is possible to change the situation. Yes, it is. Look at that. We have some examples in Europe. ENG Metal Union. This is the biggest metal workers union in Europe. It established in Germany. It's not, I repeat, it's not compulsory for them to have collective agreements in this big companies. It's not compulsory for them. However, they have had the possibility of ne agreed, negotiating these collective agreements with these big companies and created the Ombudsman's Office. This is a sort of arbitrage, a sort of. It's a tribunal, it's a trial composed by five members all of them independent, two workers representative, two employers representative, and a judge, social, belonging to the social, um, social order. And they, at the, as the ombudsman office, are solving the problems, the conflicts that arises, that is, are generated between workers and employers. Their decisions are assumed as collective agreements, although they have not this level, but they are assumed as this. And the most important thing, do you know what is this, is that small companies attached to these big companies are following the laudos are following the decision given by the Oudmans office. So at the end, what we have is that sociality is pushing the other two axes to change the reality. We have no norms, but we have the behavior, we have the interest of employers and employees to change the reality. Although there is no norms, no laws, no constitutions, no collective agreements, there is nothing unless the will of the workers and the employers to change reality. Reciprocity is pushing, is changing institutionality. We have no norms, but for, it, for us it's the same, because we behave as if we have these norms. 
which doesn't exist. Institutionality has been created at the end. There is no collective agreements, but sociality, I want to, and all of us want to, has changed this reality. And other examples, right in there. When you have companies which are not um, interested in respecting human rights, sometimes in Europe you can find social movements of consumers that discourage other consumers of buying these things. The products of these companies who are not respecting human rights. You stop buying their products, the company goes down, enter into bankruptcy, and at the end, you are forcing them to be watchful, to observe human rights, if they want to sell the products in Europe. This is an example of sociality. Consumers are changing the companies. There are no rules, and although there are rules, the companies are not observing them. However, it's the society around which are forcing the companies to change the behavior. I can move also to this other example. Uh, perhaps is a um, more difficult um, example, but in, in the same way, I can explain it. Um, it has to do with um, disabled people. According to the um, um, International Convention of Rights for Disabled People, um, the um, uh, discrimination that they suffer not only comes from the impossibility to have access to a job, I mean material obstacles, but that's so cultural ones. This says more or less that minds must be changed if we want disabled people integrated in our societies. So this international convention is looking at sociality. You people have to change your minds. We can establish norms and to make it compulsory for the companies to reserve a, pers a percentage of jobs for disabled people. But at the end, if the company doesn't want to follow the instructions, we cannot control them. It's you people who has to change your mind. Ex again, we have sociality pushing the companies to do things for changing their realities. Also, speaking about sociality, um, our constitutional court and the European, um, the European court has settled some pronunciation in this regard and has established this new idea that has been right in there, which is related with, um, um, let me, into English, the idea I'm trying to express is um, Reasonable, reasonable justice, which means that you have to adjust the job, the workplace, not only from a material point of view, but also from a social point of view, from a cultural point of view, which is very interesting. I can go deep if you want, but I have no time, so I'm going to live in this way. But our constitutional court and the European Court of Justice has been trying to settle this new idea of about reasonable adjustment of the workplace for disabled people that traspass the traditional idea of a material adjustation, adaptation of the post to much more than this. Even reducing the number, the working hours, um, um, widening the numbers of DAOs just for helping them to be included in the work reality. And, and, um, the last one is related with um, the role that trade unions are called to develop in societies. In the European society, trade unions has a strong responsibility because they are in charge of negotiating collective agreements, which means to make to um, cooperate workers and employers. But sometimes it doesn't happen.
No. What we find is that trade unions are very interested in, in their own interests, not in the employer ones, not even in the worker ones. So what we have is um, self-interested collective agreements, which are not favorable for nobody, unless for themselves. The ILO Convention number 98 prohibited this behavior, prohibited this behavior, so as you can see, institutionality in this example is working. The problem comes from the reciprocity, the behavior of the um, unions. How can we change this behavior? In Europe, easily, workers are continuously detaching from unions. Unions are alone. There are no affiliations. The number of uh, affiliations are dropping off continuously, continuously, continuously. Workers don't believe in unions anymore. So, this is a strong problem because the salaries, vacancies, and whatever you want are predetermined in collective agreements. But collective agreements cannot be negotiated because the unions are not representative of the workers anymore, which is a strong problem. As you can see, sociality push the other way around. So institutionality exists, but it doesn't work properly. Is society and sociality what is making the unions to change their behaviors if they want to be representatives of the workers? Okay. I assume that I have trespassing a lot my 60 minutes. In any case, I can see your suffering faces, which means I have trespassed them enough. Um, I am obviously thankful for your attention and at your disposal for any question that you want to put. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Porras, for that very enlightening discourse on how, and a very good reminder, actually, on how we should view the law from that relational approach. To give his reaction, I uh, would like to welcome our first reactor of the day, Professor Teodoro Alejandro Calo IV. He obtained his Juris Doctor degree from the Ateneo de Manila University in 1997. He has several master degree, master's degrees. He has a Master of Laws degree from the Harvard Law School, obtained in 2001. He also has a Master of Studies in Sustainable Leadership, Wolfson College, University of Cambridge in 2015. And he also obtained a Master's in Business Administration from Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University, and HKUST Business School in 2012. Let's all welcome a leading practitioner and expert in alternative dispute resolution, Professor Teddy Kalau. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Porras for that very comprehensive and to the extent possible concise uh, description and overview of the relational justice approach. There's a lot to chew on in her presentation. And unfortunately, I only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to just focus on three major points, and I'm going to try to contextualize that in our setting. First thing I'd like to highlight, really, is, the, is an underlying dichotomy of legal education, for the, of those of us in law school, no, but which is often overlooked. And that is the fact that we focus so much on the rule of law versus the role of law. When we talk about the rule of law, we highlight how do you design norms, how do you institutionalize them. And when you go through law school, for those of you who are law students here, that's all you study here in Philippine Law School for four years. There is very little discussion, as a matter of fact, almost no emphasis on the role of law which is how stakeholders are impacted by its application. 
And that's what the relational justice highlights to us. It's not just about setting norms. And I think that's why it's really important. I, I want to highlight, you know, just an example of how this kind of blinder, this focus so much on rule, on ro rule of law versus role of law, impacts our education. I was, three years back, I was on the panel of a Master of Law student. And one of his key points was, uh, with regards to tre international treaty ad arbitration, the fact that you should not, ma you should make sure that the if there's a panel of three, that none of them are nationals of the of uh, the parties involved. Now his basis for that, I asked him, what's his basis for that? His sole basis was the fact that it has become accepted practice in commercial arbitration. So I asked him, yeah, but if that just because it's a practice doesn't mean that should, you know, that's the real rationale. What's the rationale there why if you're going to be an arbitrator, you should not be a national of the country where your party is from? Do you have actual studies that show that it creates such a great bias that disclosure cannot cure? Well, his uh, literature review stopped there. And I can't blame him because in law school, that's all, at least a law school here, in law schools here, that's all we focus on. What do the legal journals said? When actually there is, there is a lot of research in psychology highlighting conflict of interest if you're a national of a country. But, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have, you, you know, that disclosure cannot cure it if there's permission. That leads me to my second point. If we focus so much, unfortunately, on rule versus role of law here in our legal education, that leads us to end up not questioning a lot of what we uh, provide and say is best practice. Like, for example, the result, take note that the relational justice approach goes beyond the result. But what is the result often of legal disputes? There's a winner and there's a loser. What do you, how do you describe that? There's no term. There is no term in the legal discipline for that. We get that from economics. What you see there is a zero-sum game. There is a winner, there is a loser. Is justice supposed to be like that? That to me is the real beauty of the relational justice approach as highlighted by Professor Porras. It makes us go beyond the outcome or result, go beyond our focus on it, and instead also look at the interests of stakeholders and the dynamics of the process. Like I said, uh, unfortunately, I am not a labor and employment lawyer like uh, Professor Porras, so I'm going to have to use my own background. Like I said, there's a lot to chew on here. So let me go to actual examples where we can use this process, which we do in the law school. We have a course, we just launched it a year back, called Governance Law and Development which highlights many of the, uh, em what is emphasized by the relational justice approach. When we talk of, for example, motivation or reciprocity, we, one of our case studies is the cigarette, uh, cigarette sale law, where, as you know, there is, when you look at the cigarette packs, there's this really ugly picture of people dying or people really sick. What's the point of that? The point of that is that that law was passed, okay, because there have been studies, not in law, but in behavioral science, highlighting that you have to get people motivated to stop cigarette smoking because if they continue, the costs, the social costs of, uh, getting, of uh, go, making them go through the public health and the uh, process are more expensive than whatever taxes we get from those cigarettes. 
So in terms of the one dimension of the relational justice approach, that's reciprocity or motivation, there you have it. You put, that, you put those pictures there to make them always question, why am I smoking? Or, or let's go to, uh, let's go to, Sociality or relationality. Two decades ago, it would have been crazy for us to push for what in other jurisdictions like Finland is a basic income law. What's a basic income law? You provide income to everyone, really, or more particularly the poor, so that they, don't, they can go beyond looking for you know, outside of their basic needs every day. For us, that may seem crazy from a capitalistic, from a market economy perspective. But what does, you know, the focus on relationships tell us? That unfortunately, one reason why we are getting to be more inequitable as a society is that it is easier to make money if you're rich. It's easier to make money as you know, to create more wealth because you're more rich as against basic income earners who have to use up all of their wealth to fund their basic needs. Oftentimes, you know, there's not enough. And that's what led to the Pamtawid Pampamilya Law. It's because of that shift in perspective from just, you know, law is for enforcement when law can actually be social changing. Or the third dimension. Let's go to the third dimension of the relational justice approach. Institutional, institutionalization. One thing that drives businessmen crazy here is the fact that getting permits, for example, business permit, fire permit, and so forth, it's unpredictable. Worse, depending on the local government, you know, you don't know how long it will take or if you have to end up being compelled to do a bribe just to get it over with. There's this new agency created by law. It's called the Anti-Red Tape uh, Agent, uh, Authority, which is headed by uh, Director General who's cabinet, who is uh, cabinet level. What's the point of that? That highlights the third dimension of what uh, Dr. Pars was saying, institutionalization. All it does, all that agency does is focus on, if you cut out the red tape, you know, moniker, is focus on state performance management. If you're a business, you should expect to get a business permit in three days that should be uniform regardless of what local government will do. And that's institutionalization in its most basic sense. You're using the law to create predictability. Here's the thing. Law schools don't teach this. Or uh, most law schools don't teach this. Or, or, or integrate it enough in our curriculums. So I think that Dr. Poras today has provided us a wake-up call to ask ourselves why. It's because we don't teach this in law schools that, given that government is dominated by lawyers, they have this very one discipline approach to the law. In the United Kingdom, okay, what I'm talking about is highlighted by them actually creating what you call a nudge unit, a behavioral science unit that looks at laws and regulations to see how relationships, stakeholder interests are impacted every time a law uh, is designed. We don't have that here. All we do is on an ad hoc basis, look abroad and say, hey, let's try to bring that here. But we don't do it at an institutional level. And I think that's because you can bring that down to how we do professional education, particularly in the law. Here's what's promising this school year. This school year, we no longer have a distinction, a segregation 
between the, and I'm speaking to the Ateneo community here, between the professional schools and the loyal schools. We are now together as one grad, uh, higher education cluster. But let me ask you, is that an opportunity to, to transform how we educate our students? Or is it merely administrative and structural? I've, uh, there's, I've, you know, uh, it's been highlighted that I have a lot of, uh, I have quite a few degrees. Here's a distinction I find ab uh, that abroad, which I don't find here. Uh, whether it's in my JD or when I did my MPA over at uh, that other school in Diliman. When, I, when we go abroad, there are three things that I appreciate that I did not find, unfortunately, in the graduate programs that I went through here. The first is research from a multidisciplinary perspective. You go to Harvard Law School, okay, where I did my LLM, their program of negotiation, it's not just lawyers. They have from the business schools, they have from the graduate education, graduate school of education, get them together. And they teach, they have, they, joint appointments are the norm. At, at the Kellogg School of Management where I did my MBA, joint appointments are the norm. You have a specialty, you know, that is applicable to this discipline. Let's hear that perspective. Our joint appointments the norm here. Teaching. You know, uh, during my LLM, I did two classes at the business school. So easy to register. Why? Because they appreciate that other perspective. Here, our law school and uh, school of managed business, graduate school of business, very difficult to do that because their, their schedule is different. So even if we wanted to, we'd have to find some way to get our students together when, for example, in the uh, course I teach, go Governance, Law, and Development, it would help if we have students from uh, the School of Government or students from business so that real, so that the students just don't learn from the teacher and the text, they learn from each other. Now, here's the thing. Ateneo, law, we are the, pi we're the pioneers. Okay, in terms of the JD program, which today has become the norm. But speaking from research and teaching perspective, do we really push multidisciplinary approaches? Do we facilitate students who want to learn from other faculties? In my view, we're not there yet, but it's an opportunity. Finally, dialogue. In my, when I was taking my Master's of Sustainability Leadership in Cambridge, what, what I enjoyed most was the fact that it was the school, the university itself, who said, you know, when we're teaching this new discipline, we can't just give it to the business school uh, judge or to uh, their school of government or to uh, one college. Let's, we have to get people together and form an institute so that we can get these ideas. Like what Professor Porras was highlighting. But are we doing that here? And I'm not just talking of Ateneo. More particularly, I'm also talking about graduate education here in the Philippines. So in my view, that's not a weakness. It's a challenge, yes. But it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity, particularly for our community, Ateneo community, to move on and focus on how we can research, teach, and dialogue together through this higher education cluster. That's, I think, the real point of the relational justice approach. We can't keep sticking to old ways. Which leads me to my third point. You know, the real beauty of relational justice approach, in my view, this is just my take, is that it makes us question and critique the assumptions of how we teach and apply the law. And unfortunately, like I said, I'm not a labor and employment lawyer. Let me just 
do it from, let me just give you examples from my area of specialty, which is dispute resolution. For many of you who are going through civil procedure now, you'll know we no longer have a direct examination. We do it by judicial affidavit. That is a practice that was adopted from arbitration. And our, that came about in arbitration precisely because from experience and studies, it became a best practice to look at how do we actually determine the credibility of a witness. Is it going through that long direct testimony orally or do you do it better during cross-examination? And studies from psychology, you know, in arbit on arbitration cases, highlights that, you know what, cross-examination is the way to go. That's why, that's why direct e examination disappeared in arbitration. Now, that's the beauty of applying a multidisciplinary approach like relational justice to uh, the way we teach and apply the law. Because... Now we know the rationale, we can have a better rationale of how we can improve the law, not just concepts of, that concern the rule of law or the structures and norms that, you know, we read about in traditional legal texts. That's, that's processes. Going to channels. I think we should also question, are we truly, when we say, a school of law, are we truly there to promote just one corridor for resolving or channel for resolving disputes? Or are we truly there to promote justice in all its ways by making sure that there are different channels to resolve disputes? Yet, traditional legal education now is focused on the, just, the litigation system as the norm. We even, in our own law, highlight that private dispute resolution is alternative dispute resolution. When frankly, most conflicts these days are actually resolved through ADR. So I'm not saying we should de-emphasize litigation. But I'm highlighting if we take the relational justice approach, we have to focus on other channels like private dispute resolution to achieve real justice. So, in a nutshell, well, just to give an example, um, it's not that, you know, we're not new, it, it's not that this approach is something alien to us. We're actually the pioneer when it comes to striving to go beyond just the traditional legal system. We've had, as a, we, as a jurisdiction, we've had the arbitration law since the 1950s. And then, as you know, uh, we have that famous case or infamous case of Justice Paras, Cayetano versus Monsod, which provides us the most expansive Definition of legal practice in the world. If you're in the washroom, you have a solution for your client, you charge that washroom time as billable, right? The thing with justice for us is we often, you know, are, you know, find it comical the way he phrased it in his time. This was the 1990s. About a lawyer being a lawyer, economist, lawyer, manager, Lawyer, janitor, it's not on the case law, but you get the drift. But, you know, he had it right. I think what Justice Paras, with the hindsight of practice of two decades, got it right in highlighting that, in that case, law is not just about teaching and applying traditional litigation so it's more expansive than that. It is facilitating true justice. And that, I hope there are no representatives here. I'm just joking if there are. And that is why uh, that other law school in Diliman, if you go to their school, 
You see in front of the, I don't know if it's still there, you see this gigantic panel. Uh, the business of a law school is not just to teach the law, it is to teach the law in a grand manner. What does that mean? You can, you, you know, there are a lot of ways of that can be interpreted. And by the way, that's not by an alma mater, that's by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Okay, so it's not, yeah, uh, no, uh, is the law, you know, teaching all its fits intricacy so you can find the loophole? That's not the Ateneo. That's not Ateneo Law School. At Ateneo Law School, in my view, we teach the law because we aim to best facilitate justice. Yeah, and you can make a lot of money in the process also. <laughs> but that, you know, uh, there are many ways of doing that. But that's what we should truly aim for. That's what the relational justice approach is teaching us. So in a nutshell, I'd like to thank Dr. Porras in giving us a wake-up call, telling us, look, you know, there's so much more to what we can do with legal education. And base, basing on her uh, presentation, let me highlight it in one sentence, based on the dimensions of the relational justice approach that she highlighted. First, when it comes to institutionality, Dr. Porras, has, and I'm thankful for this, has highlighted that we need to be more multidisciplinary. And that's our challenge. That's our challenge in particular as we now are one higher education culture uh, cluster. Are we, you know, structurally and administratively just that or should we be more? Second, in terms of sociality or relationality, we have to go back to our theme of ad majorem de gloriam in, in, at, in Jesuit education. We need to be more empathetic with in identifying actual stakeholder interests and addressing those when faced with legal challenges. In other words, you cannot use the hammer of traditional legal thinking for every challenge of justice that needs to be addressed. Some Sometimes, for example, you need the screwdriver of behavioral science. But most importantly, in terms of reciprocity or motivation, the third dimension, I'd like to thank Dr. Porras for highlighting to us that we need to be more imaginative. As she highlighted, Dr., uh, our national hero, Rizal and Gandhi, we need to be more imaginative in perceiving how justice should be truly facilitated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Teddy Kalao, for that very enlightening reaction to the discourse made by, sorry, I've been corrected. Is it uh, Dr. Salas? Salas, forgive us. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Salas Porras. Thank you very much. In fact, the exchange of discourse between Dr. Salas and uh, Professor Teddy Kalau is uh, reminiscent of that other Oliver Wendell Holmes saying, the life of the law has not been logic, it has always been experience. And that has been highlighted by the exchange of discourse this afternoon. Uh, this morning, sorry. We now move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is going to talk to us about the human rights and constitutional jurisprudence, Dr. Jose Joao Abrantes. He is a full professor at the Nova University Lisbon School of Law and the president of the Portuguese Constitutional Court. Since 14 July 2020, he has served as justice at the Portuguese Constitutional Court and on April 25, 2023, he was elected president of the Portuguese Constitutional Court. He holds bachelor's, literatura, and master's degrees from the Faculty of Law on University of Lisbon, where he was assistant professor from 1981 to 1992. He holds a doctor of philosophy from the University of Bremen and a habilitation, Agricacao, from the Nova University Lisbon School of Law, he was a legal consultant for the Caixa Geral de Depositos Bank 
From 1985 to 2009, he has conducted research at several foreign universities and received research grants from various institutions such as the Human Rights Directorate of the Council of Europe, the Deutsche Akademische Oysterdienst, the Carlos Gubinkian Foundation, and the Fundacao para Esciencia e Tecnología. He has actively participated in congresses and seminars and given courses and quite a large number of conferences. He has published over 100 written works in both Portugal and abroad and various branches of law, especially in labor law, civil law, civil procedure, constitutional law, and fundamental rights. He was pro-rector of Nova University Lisbon from 2013 to 2020, as well as, as the university student's ombudsman from 2011 to 2018. He is also a member of NOVA's Ethics Council, as well as belonging to a range of other academic associations and networks, such as the Portuguese Labor Law Association, APODIT, of which he was vice president of the governing board from 2013 to 2019, and also the Association of Labor Studies, AEL, of which he was a member of both Governing Board and the Supervisory Board. He is also a member of the editorial committees of various Portuguese and foreign law journal, such as the Questões Laborais, Themis, the Juridical Tribune, the Copernicus Journal of Political Studies, Revista Jurídica Luso Brasileira, Revista Jurídica de la Universidad de León, and Derito de la Relazioni Industriali, he is a founding member of the European Labor Law Network, the advisory network of the European Commission's Directorate General for Employment, Social Welfare, and Equal Opportunities since 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all give a warm round of applause for Dr. Jose Joao Abrantes. Good morning to everybody. First of all, I want to greet you all and above all to thank the Ateneo uh, University and the Ateneo Faculty of Law and the organization of this uh, colloquium for this opportunity to talk about this uh, theme, about this issue, fundamental rights and constitutional jurisprudence, and uh, uh, to thank for the warm welcome here in the Philippines. And uh, quoting my colleague and friend, Professor Maria Salas Porras, uh, we are delighted with your welcome, with your warm welcome, uh, we have spent a wonderful day in Manila yesterday visiting Intramuros. It was a wonderful visit and also uh, our time with uh, the people of the Ateneo University and of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. It was uh, absolutely fantastic. And uh, I have a particular pleasure to be here in this uh, uh, Caleza project because in a certain way I am uh, one of the co-founders in the origin of this project in my own university. I see here my Portuguese colleagues. Uh, and um, this project uh, with the Nova University of Lisbon the Malaga University uh, and uh, also the Philippines University uh, is a very, a very important project and uh, I have understood that in fact is working very well and reaching uh, very good outcomes, excellent outcomes. I have been with you all in the Constitutional Court one year ago and also in the Nova School of Law, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. So that's why I 
profiting the only, the only week I have of vacations this year in my court. It is this week I have profited not to come in vacations, but working with these conferences, but to be here with you. It's really very stimulating, and, uh, and I am here with uh, a great honor and with a great pleasure. So, uh, first of all, my thanks again, and my uh, greetings to you all, my colleagues, dear professors, dear colleagues, dear students, and uh, after hearing Professor Maria Salas Porra and uh, Professor Teodoro uh, that uh, have made excellent conferences, I want uh, to talk to you about fundamental rights and constitutional jurisprudence and uh, uh, talking above all for the students uh, in this moment, but uh, naturally for everybody, but thinking of the students and replying in a certain way, the way of doing it of my dear friend, Professor Maria Salas Porras. Uh, of course, you know this concept of fundamental rights and if we talk about human rights, fundamental rights, we should recall until the beginnings of the constitutionalism, at least, at least, to the liberal revolutions of the ends of the 18th century and of the beginnings of the 19th century, uh, the American Revolution, the independence of the United States, the Bill of Rights, uh, namely the famous Bill of Rights, the Charter of the Human Rights, of the rights of uh, the person and of the citizen of the National Assembly of France of uh, 26 August uh, 1789. And uh, as you know, you know this concept, Bill of Rights, of course, uh, the concept that comes from the beginnings of the liberalism and of these liberal revolutions uh, that by opposition to the absolute state introduced expressly in the Constitution, in this Declaration of Rights, in this Bill of Rights, the idea of the limits to the political power. And this idea of the limits to the political powers has to do essentially with the idea that uh, everybody, every man and every woman in that time in this Bill of Rights, it was only written refer to every man, but of, uh, of course we are relating this to every human being as certain individual natural rights. And these individual natural rights have to be assured, have to be granted to all of them because they are natural, they are inherent to be a human being. And uh, the role of the state, the role of the law, is not only to protect these human rights, but to recognize that these human rights are uh, anterior, are previous to the prop concept of community and of the state. And so they exist for every human being and the role of the state through the constitution is to grant, is to assure uh, these, uh, these human rights to everybody, to every human being. And uh, uh, I recall again the reference to the Declaration des Droits de l'Homme et du Citoyen the, from, the French, from the French National Assembly. It's the Magna Charter of the liberalism uh, that says exactly this in, the, uh, in its first article, says that uh, every human being is certain number of individual natural rights and uh, should the state, should the community as state, as political power, grant, assure these, uh, these human rights and above all, we should make the connection with 
Article 4 of this Declaration of Rights that says that these, in a certain way, these rights are absolute rights uh, only having as limits uh, the equal rights of all the other citizens, all the other persons. And in Article 16 of this Bill of Rights, in the Magna Charta of the liberalism, of the liber liberal legal order, uh, we have also uh, the idea of separation of powers. Uh, exactly through the system of checks and balances to grant the same idea of individual freedom, individual liberty of these uh, human rights. Uh, so, uh, not only in facing this idea of absolute uh, rights for everybody, only having to limit as limits the equal rights of the other human beings, but also a certain way, a certain way of organizing the political power, the state, through the idea of separation of powers. As you know, as you know, here we can find the ideas of Rousseau and of Montesquieu. The ideas of Rousseau through the idea of general will, the parliament expressing the general will through the law, uh, through the enacting of norms of the law, and the, the idea of Montesquieu, the idea of separation of powers, above all the idea of legislative power, executive power, and judicial power. And uh, uh, this is very well expressed, that's why I am referring to uh, this French declaration, uh, the Déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen de, uh, from of uh, 1789. So, uh, now talking specifically about fundamental rights and constitutional jurisprudence or constitutional scrutiny, this is an idea that is a sustaining pillar of any democratic legal system. Scholarly and public debates about the proper scope and limits of judicial power have become the order of the day in different jurisdictions in the last few years. And uh, we should think about, for example, recent development in countries such as Poland, Israel, United States or Brazil that suggest that we take democratic constitutionalism for granted and sometimes it's not like that. Uh, what we have observed in the last times in this and uh, these are only four examples, four examples, very uh, suggestive examples, uh, the decisions of the Constitutional Court of Poland, for example, or uh, some decisions in Israel, or also the relations between the, the, the executive power, the government, and the judicial order in the United States with Trump, or in the Brazil with Bolsonaro, uh, suggest and can us um, understand what are the dangers for the democratic orders when the understanding of uh, uh, the constitutional uh, jurisprudence or the constitutional powers or even in general the judicial power is not correctly understood. Practices directed as emptying courts of their power of legal scrutiny and practical authority are sometimes obfuscated by the expression of seemingly innocuous views on the role of courts in a constitutional order. On some views, the democratically elected legislator should play a leading role in promoting and protecting the fundamental rights of individuals. This is correct, but according with some uh, doctrines, with some ideas with some theories, 
non-democratically elected courts with constitutional review powers should have a very limited role to play in overseeing and or overruling the exercise by the legislator of its lawful powers, even when it hinders the exercise of constitutionally protected fundamental rights. Such points of view focus on reasons to be wary of ju judicial activism or the expansion of judicial power. They stress the risk of judicial encroachment into the legislative or executive domains. On other views, exactly the opposite, constitutional judicial scrutiny is a fundamental tool in the protection of individuals against arbitrary uses of power by other polit political authorities. Such views emphasizes the role of courts of constitutional review as guardians of the law of the Constitution. They stress the risk of legislative or executive encroachment into the judicial domain. As you can see, the problem is always, uh, as we should face this relationship between the legislative and the executive powers, uh, and the, the judicial power, and namely uh, the, uh, the role of the courts, and namely of the constitutional courts. Talking specifically and departing from the point of view uh, of my court, of the Portuguese constitutional court, and, and of course you don't know specifically the uh, the way of acting and above all the structure of the Portuguese Constitutional Court, but of course in the debate I am available to, to talk also about that. But the primary fun function of the Portuguese Constitutional Court is the constitutional review of legislation. Constitutional justice is a system of standards, practice, and institutions with the dual function of judicially settling constitutionally relevant conflicts of norms, including naturally the norms that limit fundamental rights, and also providing individual citizens more or less formal ways of protecting and promoting their rights, freedoms, and other constitutionally relevant interests. The court's authority to declare the incompatibility of legislation with the Constitution entails the ability to guide and condition the exercise of legislative power. As uh, perhaps you have already heard, I'm talking above all for the students, naturally uh, the professors and uh, our colleagues know these concepts, uh, but I'm talking above all for the, the students. Kelsen talked about, Hans Kelsen talked about the uh, legislative negative power of the constitutional courts. The institutional design of the Portuguese constitutional court combines elements of the North American model of diffuse control and the Austrian, from Kelsen, from Hans Kelsen, the Austrian model of concentrated control. In Portugal, we have uh, uh, the concrete control of uh, constitutionality of norms, uh, as we have talked yesterday in the evening, and uh, we have uh, the abstract control of the constitutionality of norms. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this combination between elements of the North American model of diffuse control and the Austrian model of concentrated control. But above all, uh, reporting to the North American model, we should say that on the one hand, all ordinary courts are constitutional courts. Each court in Portugal, in our system, according to this uh, diffuse control model, is a constitutional court because the ordinary courts have the power to refuse to apply a provision in concrete cases 
on the basis of a judgment of unconstitutionality. But on the other hand, the Constitutional Court has also the specific function of deciding questions of constitutional interpretation and declaring the unconstitutionality of legislative provisions, which entails their invalidity with erga omnes effect. That is the difference between concrete control and abstract control. Uh, I should say that in Portugal, we have uh, within the abstract control, we have the preventive control uh, before the entrance in force of the law that, uh, that can avoid this entrance in force of the law and, uh, and uh, we have the abstract successive control. It is important to note, however, that the object of constitutional scrutiny in the Portuguese system is always the normative content of a legal provision issued by the legislator, not a decision or any other kind of fact by other public bodies. The court relies on a functional concept of norm for the purposes of constitutional scrutiny. A norm is any rule of conduct addressed to individuals or administrative authorities, a decision-making criterion for the latter or for the courts or any standard of behavior. In the Constitutional Court, we uh, judge only norms, not uh, concrete cases. Uh, we don't judge decisions of other uh, courts of other courts uh, and uh, above uh, other subjects, only constitutional matters and in an incidental way uh, as appeal from the ordinary courts. It is also worth nothing, uh, noting, it is also worth noting that unlike other constitutional courts, for example, the German Federal Constitutional Court and the Federal Supreme Court of Brazil or also in Spain, there is no direct access by individuals to the Portuguese Constitutional Court. The Portuguese constitutional system does not have a mechanism uh, similar to the constitutional complaint, the German Verfassungsbeschwerde, the, the constitutional complaint, or for example, in Spain, uh, the Recurso de Amparo, the Recurso de Amparo. The access to the Constitutional Court in Portugal by individuals whose rights may be at stake is possible only indirectly in the context of an appeal lodged in the course of proceedings in an ordinary court. This may happen in two types of cases. Another court, an ordinary court, refuses to apply a particular provision to the facts of the case on the basis of an inconstitutionality judgment, either by the ordinary court itself or by the uh, constitutional court previously. Or the unconstitutionality of a particular provision is raised in proceedings, but the ordinary court decides to apply it to the facts of the, the case, regardless uh, this uh, submission to the court. Even in such cases, however, the Constitutional Court acts as a court of review rather than appeal. Uh, the Constitutional Court judge only norms. This does not mean that our constitutional justice system does not attribute institutional repercussion to the privileged level of protection that the very concept of fundamental rights implies. The court has mechanisms of indirect fundamental rights protection. On the one hand, incidental review of constitutionality offers individuals who are parties in ongoing judicial proceedings a means of checking the compatibility with the constitution of a provision that negatively affects the exercise of their rights and interests. Incidental control is an important tool in promoting the rule of law value of access to courts. On the other hand, 
individuals have also the right to petition to entities which are legally, legally empowered to start abstract review proceedings in the Constitutional Court, as established in Article 52 of the Portuguese Constitution. So, not only the concrete Constitution is a way to guarantee, to assure the individual rights, but, but also this possibility of the right to petition to the entities that have the power to, uh, to go to the Constitutional Court for, uh, abstract, for abstract control of constitutionality. Uh, in the preventive control, I have talked before about the preventive control, only the President of Republic can start the proceeding, the process. Uh, there is another situation uh, that has to do with the autonomous re regions of Madeira and Açores, but uh, uh, in general, we have only the President of Republic, the, the Chef of State, but, uh, but uh, in abstract successive control, there are other entities that can also request the, uh, the, uh, the analysis of the constitutionality of norms. The added value of a specialized court like the Portuguese Constitutional Court is the rigorous scrutiny of legislative provisions in light of the Constitution, in which the greatest possible variety of the judicial, political, legal, ethical, and social sensitivities, sensitivities is brought to bear, to bear. The court's deliberative and collegial character gives it a prominent place in our constitutional architecture. Taken seriously as it has been in its first 40 years of life, collegiality has a mitigating effect on the individual preferences of justices. It disciplines the deliberative process, reinforces the independence of justices, and contributes to the issuing of higher quality judgment. In addition to the role it plays in promoting constitutionally protected rights, the court's judgments have the initial function of sharpening the concept of fundamental rights. It's very important uh, the seriousness of the use of these concepts on which constitutional dialogue depends and promotes a better uh, justice system. Concepts such as the rule of law, separation of powers, human dignity and fundamental rights are sustaining pillars of our constitutional order. And the court's case law elucidates and densifies legal concepts, clarifies their scope of application and contributes to the legal and constitutional literacy of the political community as a whole. One example of the carrying out of this important function by the Constitutional Court, uh, I can give you, for example, this one, is the landmark judgment, judgment number 509 of 2002, in which the court first outlined the fundamental right to a minimum level of existence based on the constitutional value of human dignity the principle of Article 1 of the Portuguese Constitution. So here, what the Constitutional Court made is to discover a new fundamental right, a new human right, uh, that, in our point of view, was implicit in this idea of human dignity. I quote the, the decision, the principle of respect for human dignity proclaimed in Article 1 of the Constitution and entailed by the ideal of a democratic rule of law of the Article 2 and also the Article 60, 63, paragraphs 1 and 3 of the Portuguese Constitution as, as its logical implication, a fundamental right to social security. It entrusts the social security system with the protection of citizens in all situations of absence of se or severe limitation of means of subsistence 
or the ability to work. It also implies the recognition of the right to a minimum dignified existence. It's the point 13 of the judgment. The court decided in preventive control, in this case, to declare unconstitutional a provision which restricted the right to a minimum income benefits to people aged uh, 25 years or over. The court concluded that the restriction of the right in question, the eligibility age was before char uh, change from was changed from 18 to 25 years, was not in accordance with the Constitution because it violated a fundamental right implicit in the constitutional principles of human dignity and the rule of law. Uh, as you know, th uh, there was not here a discussion specifically about the, the principle of non-social retrocess, but uh, uh, the consideration that uh, it was implicit, this fundamental right was implicit in the idea of human dignity. Uh, another point of this uh, uh, clarification of concepts, for example, more recently, judgment number five of 2003, and despite the fact that the majority did not endorse the view that there is such a right, there were five different separate opinions that have defended the existence in the, constitution, in the Portuguese constitutional legal order of an implicit fundamental right to a self-determined uh, self death or a right to die with dignity. It was not the majority of the court, but uh, there were five uh, individual pronunciations in this uh, sense, articulated on the basis of a combined reading of the right to a free development of the personality and the principle of human dignity. These two examples, and I could give much more examples, show that the court has a crucial role also to play not only in sharpening fundamental legal concepts of constitutional salience, but also in articulating implicit constitutional rights. Uh, now I, I take a final note about alternative dispute resolution uh, and in connection with uh, constitutional jurisprudence, only a brief note uh, to say that Article 211, number two of the Portuguese Constitution expressly mentions the arbitration tribunals. Though it does not distinguish between voluntary and compulsory arbitration tribunals, resorting to courts to resolve legal disputes is not compulsory in our constitutional order. Some disputes may be settled by arbitrators, either by agreement of the parties or by statutory provision, voluntary or necessary uh, arbitration uh, tribunals. Though arbitration tribunals do not fit the definition of courts as sovereign bodies, they are constitutionally recognized as an autonomous category of tribunals. Unlike a state judge who speaks and acts on behalf of the law and is able to rely on the coercive apparatus of the state, uh, uh, an arbitral tribunal has also the right to declare the law, the right of jurisdiction. So he has the absence of potestas, but uh, this absence of potestas is compensated by authoritas, or finality of the legal order. The arbitrator's decision, this is quoting the Constitutional Court, are proper decisions endowed with practical authority. They have equivalent binding force to that of court decision. This is the reason why ensuring that the process of appointment of the third arbitrator does not undermine the impartiality 
to the decision of the arbitrator is a constitutional requirement because impartiality is a defining feature of judicial decision making. The Portuguese Constitutional Court has issued a series of judgments affirming precisely the judicial character, the judicial authority of arbitration courts. Arbitration tribunals, such as the Arbitration Commission of the Portuguese Football League, the Arbitration Commission of Article 36 of the urban, le the urban leasing regime and certain arbitration bodies provide this for in other areas, such as, for example, in the uh, expropriations code, are genuine judicial bodies. They resolve legal disputes by impartially determining and applying the relevant legal standards to the facts of a case and issuing a decision which is binding on the parties and produces all relevant legal effects. In judgment 52 of 92, 1992, the court declared the unconstitutionality of a provision which enshrined the non-appealability of the decision of the court of arbitration for sport issued within the scope of its necessary arbitration jurisdiction. The court concluded that limitations to the self-determination of the parties compromise the requirements of independence of impartiality and of impartiality of the arbitration tribunal and by implication infringe the principle of effective judicial protection enshrined in the Portuguese constitution. Uh, I should say about this judgment that in a concurring opinion, one of justice has stressed has underlined that uh, in these situations, including disputes generally arising from administrative and fiscal legal relationships or disputes in which private entities intervene in the exercise of poly public powers, uh, state courts do not necessarily have the last word. So he, he has uh, at conformity he has accorded with the, the judgment, but has underlined, has stressed exactly this idea. In another concurring opinion, it was noted that arbitration tribunals established by statute are governed by the rules of public law and are genuine judicial bodies. Here, a vote against the majority of this decision. And uh, this was only a uh, brief note about uh, uh, the arbitration courts, just to say what for me is the essential of the position of the Portuguese Constitutional Court of the Portuguese Constitutional Jurisprudence about this specific point that has a lot of to do uh, with the team of our seminar and uh, other conferences we'll do in Iloilo. But, uh, of course, uh, my issue, my subject was, in general, the constitutional jurisprudence. I, I could uh, say much more things about the concrete features of the Portuguese Constitutional Court, but uh, if uh, you want to know anything else, naturally you can put the questions during the debate. Perhaps I should say only that uh, uh, the Portuguese uh, Constitutional Court is constituted by 13 judges, 13, 13 justices. Ten of us are elected by the parliament, by a majority of the parliament. The other three are co-opted by these ten. And uh, uh, specifically, the most important work of the Constitutional Court is naturally the control of the constitutionality of norms. As I have explained by incidental means, uh, as appeal of ordinary courts in concrete, concrete control. Uh, and uh, we have also the abstract control. Uh, one originality of the Portuguese system is this preventive control uh, even last week, 
we have had the decision of a preventive, a preventive control. Uh, the, the president, the actual president of Republic, has used his prerogative uh, only a few times, uh, only once in the his, uh, in in his first mandate, more times in the second mandate. But anyway, it is not so usual. Uh, the the delays for the decision are very short. Uh, since we are requested to decide the entrance or not in force of the norm, uh, we have only 25 days since the entrance in the court until the end. And normally are very complex cases, as I have already explained. For example, this case of the euthanasia or the assisted suicide, uh, as other cases that uh, were submitted in this. Uh, uh, abstract preventive control, uh, but uh, there is also the uh, abstract successive control, uh, naturally, without these short delays for decisions. Th this is the most important of the, the task of the Constitutional Court, but uh, in the Constitutional Legal Order in Portugal, we have also uh, a lot to do, for example, in relations with uh, political parties, with political parties, with elections, and so on. So uh, it's very different from each country to each country, the features of the constitutional courts. Uh, as I have also referred, to, we, ha we have not the uh, recurso de amparo de fefasung besverda, but uh, this is the specific fetcher of the Portuguese Constitutional Court and um, and for example recently I was in Rome in the quadrilateral of uh, the Constitutional Courts of Portugal, Spain, France and Italy and uh, when we compare the Constitutional Courts of our three uh, countries Portugal, Spain and Italy with the uh, well, it's not a, a court, but uh, the Conseil, Conseil Constitutionnel de, uh, of France, it's very different. They, they, have, uh, they have not uh, so, so wide, so broad functions, and that's why also the, the members of the Conseil Constitutionnel, um, they are not all jurists, and they, they, they all are not all. So what I have fixed here, what I have tried to note here more effectively is the concrete feature of the Portuguese Constitutional Court, but of course I remain available for your questions. Thank you for your attention. It was, uh, it is for me a great pleasure and honor to be here in Ateneu University, in the Ateneu Faculty of Law. Thank you for the invitation and to be in the framework of this Congress of Caleza. It is really a great pleasure and honor. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrantes. At this juncture, we would now like to call on our second reactor, who would be giving his thoughts and insights to the discourse of Dr. Abrantes. The second reactor is no stranger to us, our very own Dean Sedfrif Candelaria, our former Dean of the Ateneo Law School. Uh, he obtained his uh, Juris Doctor Bachelor of Laws degree in 1984 from the Ateneo de Manila School of Law and also obtained his Master of Laws from the University of British Columbia in 1986 as a Rotary International Foundation Ambassadorial Scholar. He has written countless uh, journal articles on human rights, and I dare say that he is one of our prominent, uh, not only human rights advocate, but uh, human rights warrior in the country. Let's all welcome our very own Dean Sedri Candelaria.
thank you very much, Attorney Kao, for conferring a Juris Doctor degree upon me. I am only a Bachelor of Laws degree holder. We introduced Juris Doctor during our time. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, of course, I'd like to welcome our uh, Honorable President from the uh, Constitutional Court no, of Portugal, a good friend by now, uh, His Excellency Jose Jao Abrantes, and of course, the lovely wife, uh, Madam Maria Helena Delgado. Okay. I'm pleased to meet both of you. And of course, to our friends from uh, UMA, old friends, no? And new friends from, of course, uh, UMA and also from NOVA, School of Law, who are around here, okay? You brave the rains, thank you as we have been laboring in for a number of weeks already. Okay? To my dear colleagues at the Ateneo Law School, Dean Joey, Dean Maita, and of course our esteemed professors and students, uh, my co-professors, and of course the, the host uh, venue, which is uh, the Ateneo de Manila University, and our respected uh, officers, uh, particularly uh, Dean Tuanyo. Randy, thank you for staying on huh, from the School of Government. Okay. I think I'll leave the rest for uh, other appropriate introductions later on. But let me go through a few points uh, by way of reaction. As I know, we are all hungry. Some may not have had breakfast. No, but I'll limit myself to about roughly 15 to 20 minutes. No? to work within the time frame. Now let me begin by thanking, of course, uh, His Excellency. <clears throat> I had the benefit of uh, reading your excellent uh, summary of your presentation and in a way, a nutshell of the um, Constitutional Court of Portugal, which we listened to when we were in Lisbon last time. So I begin with probably some comparisons no, that you have raised and I feel obliged to react, to compare a little bit, no? Not to critic, but to compare and see the different experiences of our societies and also our constituencies in this country. So first of all, I call your attention to the history of the Philippine Constitution. We've had the Malolos Constitution that was uh, right after this, the revolution against Spain, very short-lived. Filipino constitution, we say, after which, of course, the Americans came, we had the um, 1935 constitution. It's called the Commonwealth Government. No? And after which, um, we had to amend it no? in 1973, where we had what we call a constitutional authoritarianism, where martial law was being enforced at the same time we had the constitution and the idea was for the constitution to prevail in the context of a martial law regime. Thus, it was called constitutional authoritarianism. Then we had the People Power Revolution, which brought about the 1986 uh, changes, no? and eventually the adoption of the 1987 constitution, which is now in effect. And I'd like to say that this is uh, quite a remarkable fusion of both political, civil, rights and social uh, economic no? rights. You have Article 3 referred to as our Bill of Rights, and you have Article 13, which is a new feature of the 1987 Constitution, which focuses on social justice, as Dr. Maria mentioned. No? It's a new concept, but it opens the door for certain rights that are not necessarily individual, but focused on collective rights rights of farmers, fisher folk, labor, indigenous peoples, persons with disability, elderly, women, etc. So you now have that embrace of developments in international human rights law in the context of the 1987 Constitution. But we remain to be filthy to the individual rights, Article 3. And we've always thought the Constitution in a way that says uh, the Bill of Rights is an exercise, is actually a limitation on the exercise of governmental power. And therefore, the slightest infringement on your 
rights could bring about a challenge before the Supreme Court, which brings me to one very distinct difference no? when it comes to challenges before our courts. No? Because in our courts, you will see, as distinguished from the uh, perhaps the practice in the Constitutional Court of Portugal, no? individuals, for as long as, as it satisfies the limitation and the exercise of judicial power under Article 8, Section 21, and I quote this, judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such lower courts as may be established by law. The second paragraph has become very, very revolutionary in that sense because of interpretations made by the Supreme Court through the years under the 1987 Constitution. And I quote the second paragraph. Judicial power includes the duty of the courts of justice to settle actual controversies. So I make the distinction again from the practice of the constitutional court between what you call preventive control as distinguished from abstract reviews. Because here, you have to have actual controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and enforceable. Enforceable. And the last clause in this second paragraph of Article 8, Section 1 is what became a very celebrated, I think, uh, venue for constitutional interpretation called the expanded power of the Supreme Court. And that says, and to determine whether or not there has been grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of government. And again, I make the distinction because Portuguese constitutional court seems to be very focused on the norms affecting legislation in particular. When it comes to the executive branch, I think, in our sense, we have covered both the executive and the legislative branches. And any act by any of the agencies from the executive branch can be brought up on the basis of what our students, no, Dr. Maria, love to put acronyms and they'll recite in class and say, there is Godledge. <laughs> Godledge means, as they know, first year should know, grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction. You know, when I first heard that, I said, why did I not think of this when I was a student? <laughs> but I discouraged them to use it. Use the proper phrase. So um, this is perhaps something that also distinguishes our constitution and the power of the Supreme Court in this country. For having to see this, again, I'd like to come closer to the practice, though, of the Constitutional Court of Portugal, where it is not at all times that every individual, every Juan, every Juana, no, walking on the street, no, can go to the Supreme Court. Because this limitation still says you have to have proof of a legally enforceable right, demandable and enforceable, right? Well, I would say looking at the number of cases assigned to you by your terrorist professors in first year and also in fourth year in constitution, you will see that that perhaps is uh, I, I'd rather hold my comment on this, but to say we have a number of jurisprudence that somehow had relaxed it. Because the issue we are involved in litigation is standing. You have to prove that you have the standing before the court. I have a right that's violated Article 3, probably to a certain extent, social justice, human rights provisions, Article 13, but I have to show proof of that. That has been relaxed a number of times because if a person does not have such interest to prove, there might be an opportunity for the court because of the gravity 
of the impact of such violation or even potential violation of a right, either by way of law, by way of executive action. And that is where a term that we have used, His Excellency here, transcendental importance. It has to a certain extent even become notorious when it comes to constitutional litigation because everyone wants to go up to the Supreme Court and fill the dockets of the Supreme Court with every opportunity when one's rights had been violated. For some time, the Supreme Court opened the doors to transcendental importance, but realizing, of course, the fact that we are not just purely a constitutional court as you are, but we have both original and appellate jurisdiction here, the Supreme Court is, of course, filled with its dockets of so many different cases, not just constitutional cases. Thousands of cases are in the Supreme Court. So they also tried to restrict that by way of interpretation that transcendental importance will not at all times become the basis for you to go around the standards of judicial power and judicial review. Now, a little, a few words about the relationship between the constitutional court and its review power over actions of lower courts. Because similarly, we have a provision in the constitution you know, that says under Article 8, Section 5, you have the original jurisdiction of the court over certain matters, you know, ambassadors, cases, for example, uh, foreign dignitaries, but you have certiorari or certiorari, which is a form of review at first instance there. Like the expanded power, it's a form of certiorari on grave abuse of discretion. You have also what we call uh, review powers, no? That will, well, original jurisdiction, no? habeas corpus, I think that's a familiar term for you. Uh, we also have um, mandamus, co-warranto cases, no? But the second, which is appellate review, pertains to decisions of lower courts. Maybe reviewed, affirmed, reviewed, affirmed, or even denied on the basis of a review power of the Supreme Court. When it comes to, for example, lower courts do have the power to declare certain executive actions as unconstitutional, treaties, international agreement, no? other executive actions, no? and even law. The lower courts can declare a law unconstitutional. But why do we have very few when it comes to review on that, on that matter? This is where some of the lower court judges hesitate to act on such a very serious allegation of unconstitutionality, although they do have. And we have been at the Judicial Academy training our judges to say, you know, you spare the court of such dockets filled with First instant cases, no? So try to decide. Try to decide cases of unconstitutionality on this. That's part of our judicial education training now. And let the court review it later on. But you have to act on it. You have to act on it. Okay? Another thing I'd like to emphasize also is the fact that um, in one provision now of the 1987 Constitution, Individuals can go straight to the Supreme Court to question the proclamation of martial law or the declaration of martial law or the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. One of the few cases where you will find in the Constitution allowing an individual straight to the Supreme Court to question it. So these are some of the developments in so far as standing is concerned in this country. And uh, let me say a few things, though, about what you might be surprised as advisory opinions. No? In this context, we don't give advisory opinions. The Supreme Court cannot. And this is always one distinction I ask our students here in international law. 
you learn from first year that Supreme Court cannot give advisory opinions, right? Those are hypotheticals because Supreme Court decides on concrete cases. Even individual rights indirectly violated by agencies of government can be reviewed later on. But hypothetical, no. I cannot go and say, is this violative and you have not proven any actual case or controversy. In public international law in second year when you go, that's the difference with the International Court of Justice because the ICJ can render advisory opinions. Always remember that distinction at the international and domestic level. Now, let me say a few words about the expanded power and economic or even matters that pertain to social justice issues. No? Um, way back uh, when WTO was being uh, reviewed in this country, we ratified the World Trade Organization. There was a challenge on the ratification by our president and also the Senate at the time. And one of the concerns was, should a court be reviewing a matter of economics, economic policy making? That was one of the earliest cases where the court had to be confronted of economic trade issues that land before their lap. And the Supreme Court laid down the parameters very clearly. No, we are not entering into economic policy making. But we look at the parameters by which the challenge had been brought before us. For example, uh, this violates the economic policy under Article 12 of the Constitution that Filipino labor must be given preference in this country because this might open up the you know, competition and our Filipino first policy on labor, procurement of materials, no? might be violated. Supreme Court laid down the rule very well and said, our obligations are going to be reviewed on the basis of the Constitution. No international agreement will be free from scrutiny in accordance with our Constitution. In the long run, they tried to reconcile. Anyway, WTO, GAC WTO allows for certain leeways anyway. And we were able to reconcile obligations under the Constitution and under international law. That's a creative way of trying to say that we are not going to move away from economic issues or even social issues of the day. But primarily, we will look at constitutional rights and duties. That has been done with the right to a balanced and healthful ecology, a very famous case of Posa versus Factora, on the right of future generations, no? when it comes to a balanced and healthful ecology. And more recently, very interestingly enough, behavioral economics, for those who are into economics, Supreme Court struck down a practice in the transportation industry. You know, Unfortunately, you have seen the horrible traffic. But you go to EDSA and you see the bus, the buses. No, there was at one time, buses were racing down the wire to be able to earn enough for their drivers and conductors. Because the more you get trips back and forth, EDSA, that's the long circumferential road, the more you earn. And it's because it was based on commission basis. No? They were not paid a regular pay. So it became very risky for our passengers and even pedestrians, no? where you have buses literally racing against each other, like Formula Ones. No? And that was struck down and said, by this time, using behavioral economics, explaining what motivates these people to behave in a certain manner. And now they said, no, in every contract, we will now read into this the duty of the employers to pay partly 
regular pay with all the benefits and on a commission basis. Very creative way. We look to the other disciplines. Contrary to my friend's observation earlier in the reaction, we do apply multidisciplinary thinking now, even at the law school level. And I'm proud to say that we are moving towards that direction at the highest court of the land. I can cite to you so many other examples on this, but just a, two more points. 1987 Constitution, before it became in effect, um, led to a period of interregnum. We say interregnum from the um, revolution of 86 to 87, there was a period where there was no constitution, except for a freedom constitution. No? But even before the freedom constitution, there were nothing to quote unquote regulate fundamental rights. And then a very interesting case went up to the Supreme Court involving a former crony of the past regime whose rights were violated apparently by the military, the police. And so we went up to the Supreme Court to say, I have rights despite the fact that we do not have yet a new constitution. So the question entertained was, does that person have rights? The right to uh, against unlawful searches and seizure. The Supreme Court did not find it difficult on two grounds, positivist perspective of law and the natural law perspective that even before the state, rights existed. And that the duty of a state is of course to promote and protect fundamental rights. But we do have obligations under international human rights law. And that stayed on despite the change of regime because it's still the Philippine state that was obliged to enforce fundamental human rights one very creative way of looking at rights applicable, even in the context of no written constitution as of that point. Okay. Um, could we have a situation of preventive control here, where the constitution, uh, constitutional issue of a law is brought before the Supreme Court without the law having yet been signed and enforced cannot happen here. That cannot happen. We have to have a law first that is ready for enforcement before it is brought bef before the, uh, the Supreme Court for a challenge. No? And applying these standards of what we call a potential violation of rights and obligations. I was uh, very interested in the um, example that you gave uh, your excellency on the uh, right to minimum income benefits no that uh, reduce it, uh, raised it from 18 to the 25th no? but the concept that i'd like to raise here is that of the concept of the value of human dignity um, years and years back uh, one of my interests was the uh, foreign obligations of um, developing country borrowers that had to suffer under the conditionalities of the International Monetary Fund. And I bumped into the example of the European countries also. Philippines was almost one of the few cases at the time coming out of the regime, but I read the history of uh, other countries also, uh, even in Europe, and I ran into a research where the constitutions of these countries, uh, Ireland, for example, Portugal, Spain, no? Greece, no? Uh, had to use provisions of the Constitution in order to promote a dignified life despite the huge indebtedness of a country to foreign creditors. We used the prism of human rights the right to development in this country in order to promote uh, con conditionalities that had to be 
addressing the priority of this country, like education, health, social benefits. No? So I was wondering whether this could have been a proper provision also when it comes to putting up no, challenges to our obligations with external creditors, for example. Um, just a last point on arbitration, since you put a note on arbitration. Um, Professor Ted Kalau um, was here a while ago. I, I thought he would have been a better person to do this, but I just want to raise one case, one unique case that went up to the Supreme Court. Because the general rule here is arbitration respects the autonomy of the parties. And decisions of arbitral bodies here go up for enforcement by the court. There is legislation on this. But one unique case went up on the basis of due process. The, the, losing, the losing party said, we were marginalized on the basis of the fact that one of the arbitrators no, gave a law journal article to one of the parties or both parties, in fact, to say, you might want to look at this journal article that might affect your case. Unfortunately, it favored the position of the other party. And on the basis of which, a decision of the arbitral body was released. And of course, the losing party went up to the Supreme Court. Would the Supreme Court now entertain this on constitutional review? One of the few cases, I think, or probably the first I have read, the Supreme Court struck down the arbitral judgment on the basis of the fact that there was partiality on the part of the arbitrator. It was a due process issue, a bill of rights issue. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And this was an an expression of what we call partiality on the part of the arbitrator. The famous case of RCBC involved a local bank here. Okay. So um, I end as I promised. Uh, I heard the bell here in the campus. When you hear the bell, uh, it says uh, I should sit down. But thank you again for this privilege of uh, giving a reaction. Uh, and uh, we're still around for any questions, if you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean said. Dean said, I must confess, you look very much the same as uh, when I saw you when I was a student. So I still think of you as a part of the Juris Doctor batch. <laughs> so pardon me for promoting your degree. <laughs> Okay, at this juncture, maybe now call on back our uh, distinguished speakers for the open forum, Dr. Salas and uh, Dr. Blantes, and also Dean Cedric Candelaria. Maybe invite you to the front, please, sir. Yes, please. Okay, so to the first year law students, uh, today's symposium is very timely. Most of you have just finished reading Republic versus Andigan Bayan and also Tanyada versus Angara. That those should uh, certainly give you a flavor of that multidisciplinary approach, especially when it comes to constitutionalities. Okay, we now open the floor to questions. Professor RP. I am. Good morning. R.P. Santiago from the Ateneo Law School and also from Ateneo, Ateneo Human Rights Center. Uh, I'll uh, start not only because it's almost, oh, well, it's already lunchtime, <laughs> but at the same time, I heard from uh, one class that uh, if I start, they will also start asking questions. Hint, hint. We heard about concepts earlier, 
earlier about uh, relational justice approach, um, preventive control. We've heard about the, um, the expanded jurisdiction of the Supreme Court here in the Philippines uh, with uh, the grave abuse of discretion resulting to a lack of or excess of uh, jurisdiction by the Supreme Court. I didn't use Cad Lynch, uh, Dean said. Uh, but I wanted to ask about its relationship, particularly to um, this concept of judicial activism. Um, maybe our guests from Europe could uh, expound further on how these concepts, uh, have they supported that concept of judicial activism or have, they, have this been an issue in Europe? And probably Dean said can uh, further elaborate on uh, what had been the limits of judicial activism here in the Philippines? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And, uh, in the beginning of my speech, I have talked about that, only a brief note, uh, trying exactly to put in opposite, in opposite different views about the role and the relationships between the judicial uh, power and uh, the legislative and executive power. And um, uh, above all, I have underlined uh, the dangers that we can see uh, nowadays, uh, saying uh, the examples exactly of some countries. And, uh, but uh, you, have, you have put your underlining, and your stress, in the problem of the judicial activism. And um, about, about, uh, about that, as you know, ah, ah, it's better like that. Uh, about that, this is discussed, the problem of judicial activism or, and, or the other way the judicial deference, uh, it's in the order of the day, uh, but um, it depends as the way we can see this judicial activism, because uh, normally that reference is used exactly to try to constrain, to, to, to limit the judicial power when uh, someone uh, is, uh, is saying there is a problem of ju judicial activism. It's reported to say that uh, the judges that are not democratically el elected so have much more power and uh, they are not controlled. But uh, in fact, for example, and now specifically talking about the constitutional courts, we have uh, democratic legitimation, although indirect, indirect, because uh, as I have said, in the case, in the concrete case of the Portuguese Constitutional Court, um, we are we are elected. The majority of uh, of the judges are elected in the Parliament by a majority of the Parliament, and um, and uh, the other three, ten of us and the other three are co-opted by us. So we have uh, naturally uh, limited democratic legitimation, although indirect. But uh, uh, now concentrating about the problem of the judicial activism, uh, it is very discussed in some countries. I, I remember, for example, I have uh, uh, within the framework of my work in uh, uh, labor law, I have many contacts, for example, with Brazil, and in Brazil they, uh, they discuss a lot 
about the judicial activism. But as I say, normally these references to the judicial activism is something uh, that in general is used to limit the powers of uh, the, the courts, of the courts. They say the courts are, are uh, doing more that they can do. They are not uh, demo uh, democratically, uh, they are not elected. They, are, they have not a democratic legitimation as the parliament and as the government. That's true. The parliament, of course, has this democratic legitimation. But uh, as I, I have tried to explain, uh, since the beginning of the constitutionalism and uh, when uh, I talk, of course, uh, certain principles, we can go still before when we talk about human dignity, we can go with the, the references and the successive re reception of the of the of the the Roman law during the Middle Age and the, the influence of the Christianism, for example, the concept of human dignity of every of every human being, but uh, uh, concentrating our attention in the liberal constitutions and uh, in the liberal revolutions of the end of the 18th century and of the beginning of the 19th century and ab above all i have uh, i have concentrated my attention and my references to the the french declaration of uh, uh, rights of the the person and of the citizen uh, what I have called uh, the Magna Charter of the liberalism. So uh, not only this reference to the, uh, the individual natural rights that exist for every human being and that shall be protected having only as limits the equal rights also absolute until this sense of every other human being. Article 4 of this declaration of this Bill of Rights, but also in connection with the Article 16. The Article 16 is referred to be the definition, the concept of constitution. The constitution has two great matters. Two great matters, the, the, the individual freedom, the individual liberty, consecrating in these individual natural, natural rights and uh, the separation of powers. So uh, the main idea, uh, human rights, fundamental rights, and uh, uh, the organization of political power. Uh, of course, if we think in the evolution of constitutionalism and do, if we talk not only in the liberal constitutionalism, but afterwards, with the, the social constitutionalism, the, the, the content of constitutions are much more broader, much more wider with references to the economy and so on and so on and so on. Uh, today, the constitutions are much broader and wider than before. But uh, that is uh, known f for everybody, this evolution. But uh, of course, uh, the, the role, the role of the the courts is very important, and uh, and uh, of course the role of the constitutional courts today, and uh, it was one of my first affirmations during my speech. Uh, it it was exactly that the constitutional scrutiny is a sustaining pillar of a democratic legal order. Uh, and that is, in a certain way, an answer to those that uh, criticize the uh, judicial activism. The, the constitutional courts uh, or the Supreme Courts that exercise these constitutional review powers, as the Supreme Court of Philippines or the Supreme Court in the United States or the Supreme Court of uh, Brazil, that uh, have these, uh, these uh, uh, constitutional review powers, of course, 
have an important, an important uh, role uh, precisely to be, uh, to clarify that uh, the democratic elected powers, uh, legislative and executive, can do everything. Uh, independently of the successive democratic powers that are elected, there is the fundamental law, the constitution, and uh, that, uh, that should be respected also by the governments, by the parliamentary majorities, in, in a certain way, for example, a Portuguese uh, uh, professor of constitutional law, which is a friend of mine, Professor Jorge Reis Novaes, has written exactly about uh, the human rights, the fundamental rights, as guarantees against the, the, the majorities, against the majority. So, when we talk about uh, the judicial activism, or when we are to talk about the judicial activism, it's a way of criticizing the excessive powers in this sense of the courts, but uh, I think uh, this is not real, or that should not be real. The constitutional courts should uh, exercise these uh, powers, uh, clarifying the concepts, very important concepts like rule of law, separation of powers, fundamental rights, human dignity, all these things. In, in, inclusive uh, uh, reporting to implicit fundamental rights, as I have uh, tried to exemplify. Uh, but uh, uh, so that's why I think uh, this, uh, this should be seen also in opposite what we have, what I have referred in the beginning. The, the contrary exactly when we see this example that uh, uh, far right far right uh, uh, politicians have tried to restrain the powers of the judicial uh, the, the examples of bolsonaro in brazil or uh, of uh, trump in the united states but we see also now in israel and uh, within the European Union in Poland. The example of Poland is very clear. Recently in Portugal, we have had a very good conference to, um, to celebrate the 40 years of the Constitutional Court. And we have had a professor, a Polish professor. He lives in Australia, he is Australian Polish. And he has talked exactly about the problems of Poland uh, and Poland, inside the, the European Union, the, the relationships and the understanding of the relationships between the executive power and the executive power and the judicial power is very complex and very difficult because uh, there is a great, uh, a great uh, uh, restriction uh, to the powers of the judicial of the judicial power naturally to uh, to allow to allow that the executive power is stronger and stronger and without limits so uh, in a certain way uh, that has to do with the problems of the populism and uh, the chance in uh, even in the european societies of uh, extremist groups and populist groups that uh, try to, to justify the, um, the, wider, uh, the, the wider and broader powers of the executive powers. Uh, when we see from the beginning of the uh, constitutionalism, not only the idea of uh, fundamental rights is consecrated, but also as guarantee, as assurance of this uh, individual natural rights in the first terminology of this Magna Carta that I have referred, Ma Magna Charta. Uh, 
is uh, consecrating the idea of limitation of powers through the separation of powers. That's what I uh, have to add, uh, on which I have already uh, said before. It's that. Thank you for your question once more. Dean Mann. I'm Professor Mel Santa Maria from the Ateneo de Manila University. When you talk about judicial deference, I was just thinking how much of it is legitimate exercise of judicial restraint in so far as the executive is concerned, and how much of it is actually judicial subservience uh, in relation to the appointing power. Because in the Philippines, there was a late, lately a study that almost 90% of cases elevated to the Supreme Court by progressive groups ended up favoring the president. So I, I just find it so uh, uh, strange that 90% uh, of the time the people are wrong. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there must be some, some, uh, some answer to that somehow in looking at the personalities of people who constitute the tribunal. Because these members of the Supreme Court are just like us. They are fallible men and women. So if, if we are to check the judiciary or the executive, how could how could the people or the sovereign precisely determine whether it is legitimate judicial restraint or just simple subservience to the executive? How do you address that in Europe? Because we, we, we came from a very cruel period in our history, that is martial law during the Marcus regime. That's my question. Perhaps we can hear from uh, Dr. Maria Salas on the relational approach they mentioned when it comes to the relationship now between the executive power and the judicial exercise. Uh, Dean Sedfri, if uh, you would like to see some thoughts on the question. Because basically the situation here in the Philippines is that most of these sitting justices of the Supreme Court, the Philippine Supreme Court, are appointed by the president. So chances are, more often than not, when cases are brought to the Supreme Court, uh, it's uh, very rare that it goes against the very appointing power. Dean said? I'd rather defer first to uh, the, uh, the Honorable uh, President of the Constitutional Court because he shared during the uh, lecture that in Portugal, which is a marked difference from us, no? uh, 10 of them are elected by the parliament, whereas three are from? Co-opted. Co OK, so let me begin first with that as a background, and then I'll give my own thoughts on this. Thank you. I don't understand. As I have just said, uh, as I have just said, this is the guarantee of the uh, democratic legitimation of the of the constitutional court because. Uh, we are elected by the persons that were elected by the people. Because, uh, in fact, of course, I have talked, uh, quoting Hans Kelsen, I have talked about the legislative negative power. That uh, should not exist. That doesn't exist. The Constitutional Court should not be uh, a negative legislator. 
but uh, what we should do is to verify and uh, to avoid that uh, the norms enacted by the legislative power are in contradiction with the fundamental law. So, uh, of course, uh, in, in Portugal, the president of republic is directly elected and the parliament the same, the parliament the same. Of course, the government, uh, the government is uh, uh, an emanation of the parliament, is, uh, the government is constituted on the basis of the majority of the parliament, uh, should be supporting in the parliament. So the most important political power in Portugal is the parliament, is the parliament. That's why, that's why, but, but we have not a parliamentary regime. Uh, we have what, uh, what is called uh, similar with France, but very different with the French system. In, in praxis, we have, uh, we have a semi-presidential system. Uh, but, uh, but the parliament, uh, for example, the government, the government is responsible own, politically only uh, facing the parliament for the parliament is responsible only for the parliament um, but uh, about uh, about your question about your question uh, so what i have said what i have said is and uh, uh, through this uh, uh, kind of designation of the justices, it's the way to assure, to guarantee our democratic legitimation. That's why we are elected by the more, the more uh, representative uh, organ of sovereignty. So uh, that's one thing I think uh, uh, this shows that uh, in Portugal, uh, the things uh, have uh, functioned well. In these 40 years, the experience uh, has functioned well, I think. So, uh, to, to, guarantee, to guarantee that the judges are independent, of course, the judges uh, have to have legal, uh, legal preparation. Uh, all the justices should be, all the justices should be uh, lawyers, should be lawyers. Uh, half of the judges should be magistrates of Korea, coming from the other courts, and the, the other half of the judges uh, should be uh, lawyers with a relevant curriculum, uh, normally, normally uh, universitary professors, half, half. Uh, so, and I think this solution is also very, uh, very good because uh, we can have in the collegial decisions uh, this mission uh, between, between the academia and uh, the university and uh, the judicial career. But uh, it's different, it's different. The, the, the question that was, uh, uh, that is here now in this second question, I think is completely different. The examples that we have seen and I have referred to is that in the, in the United States, Trump, has tried through the nomination, the nomination of the judges for the Supreme Court to, to guarantee, to guarantee, and that's another thing, it's very important because, for example, in the United States, and I think also in Brazil, the judges are elected uh, without limit, without limit of time. In Portugal, our mandates uh, are for nine years, and it's not possible go uh, after 
after the nine years. So we have limited mandates. In, 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 uh, in the United States and in Brazil is completely different. That's why Trump has tried to put in the Supreme Court of the United States only people identified with his, uh, with his po politics and uh, very conservative people and the same thing in, uh, with Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, these situations are completely different uh, of any democratic country. Uh, and the, the situations I have referred also with Poland and with Israel, they are also examples of the, the trial, the, the, the attempt of the executive power to control the judicial power in these countries. All these examples I have given, Poland, Israel, uh, United States and Brazil. Uh, and uh, this is a general trend that we have today all over the world, also in the European Union, is the ascent the, of the populisms and uh, of the far right, the far right, um, uh, the far right uh, uh, parties. Uh, even recently in Spain, also in Portugal, in, uh, in, in France, uh, in Hungary, in Poland, etc. Uh, just talking the examples within the European Union. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Abrantes. Can I? Okay, thank you. So as long as I say your question, and how should be my answer from the mm, relational approach? Um, let me put things in this way, and perhaps I'm going to be politically incorrect, but it's the best option I can offer you and your question. For be honest, um, for be honest with myself, especially. Well, um, um, I didn't know how your system works, so Sigfun has explained to me briefly that you are chosen, your, the members of the Supreme Court are, are um, nominated by your uh, president, that means that probably he's, he or she is looking for people who are in favor of their thoughts uh, or his or her thoughts. So yes, this should be the common sense. And probably if you were uh, the president of the republic, do the same thing, right? Or not? Good. So just to be honest and to be in the same onda. Good. So. Um, the problem comes when so sociality is not working. Sociality <coughs> may not be working, but you have even two more axes to push forward. The first one is institutionality. I assume that when you vote, you do with, from the bottom of your head. I mean, you are doing what you think is the better for your country, for your future, and for your project of life that you want to be your project, not mine. Um, probably some of us um, um, have the same interests. Maybe he and me are thinking that the best option is the blue one and not the yellow one. And perhaps Professor Abrantes is thinking on the other way around. The problem comes when we speak about the tyranny of democracy, which is very interesting because democracy was thought, was imagined, Speaking from the Socrates point of view was thought as a way of giving voice to all members of society, but not the tyranny of the majority of them, which is something different what we are doing nowadays in our societies. So please take it on, into account this. When we speak about democracy, we should be thinking that not is what is the best for the majority, it's the best for all of us. We are all members of the society. If you are the majority party elected, good for you. But this doesn't mean or shouldn't mean that you impose your opinion. You have to share. We have to speak. We have to reflect. 
because at the end we live all in the same society. Now, I am keep on moving in my answer. I was saying that we have institutionality and we have reciprocity. Reciprocity means that individually speaking, each one of us has our own motives, behaviors, and interests. Some of them can converge, some other clash. It depends on us. But at the end, when we go and vote, we have a result. And we have our representatives, right? We have the parliament. And the parliament has to control judges and then the executive power. All this works in this way, more or less, more or less. They are contamination, as Professor Abrantes has been speaking. Um, let's go to focus on norms. If the norms lead you to an unfair result, an unfair outcome, an unfair output, what are you going to do? What can you do? Unobserve the norm? Not follow the norm? What are you going to find at the end of the road? Chaos. Because society is not going to feel evocated, never, by the norm. The norm says A, but you think that A is not correct. So you are not going to, to observe A. You are going to do B. At the end, you are going to take the justice by your hand. And this is very dangerous. No political power wants this. No public powers want this. So what do you have in this situation? What are the solutions? Sociality means that judges, for example, can give an answer. But this answer, as he was saying, can be a mistaken one, not wanted. What do you have? Civil society has a strong power. You are, you people, are much more than judges and politicians together. Change. Go to the street. I'm not, I'm not asking you to go and set fire to all the official buildings now. I'm not saying this. What I'm saying is we don't like this. We don't want this. There are, what other option do you have? In Spain, we are having, you were speaking before, uh, judicial activism. In Spain, sometimes we ask for judicial activism because the vast majority of our politicians are stupid politicians. <laughs> How is possible that they arrive at the power? It's because we have both them. Do you understand? But then comes com common sense. And we start asking for things that are not possible, as for example, judicial activism. We ask them to react, stupid, react you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that sometimes we force things because we don't do things properly. So the first important thing in a society is to sit down and reflect. What project of society do you want? Then opt and vote and ask to your politicians to be what they have to be, a part of the society and not the whole society, which is very important. Sit down, speak with each other, and make a decision, an agreement. An agreement, but not for the majority, for all of us. The small part is as unimportant as the big part. Okay, uh, imagine, for example, be a Christian in the middle of the Roman circus. If the Romans think that the Christian being devoured by the lion is funny, this means that it's funny? Not for me, I am the Christian. Do you understand what I'm saying? So happiness, happiness um, uh, will be in welfare, cannot be relative concepts, must be full concepts. If you are happy, I must be happy. Perhaps not you 90% and me 10%. Let's say 50%, 50% if it's possible, and if not, 60 and 40, but never less than this. 
And this should be the responsibility of the society, not the politicians. Because politicians, at the end, are there because we have elected them. Again, in Spain, we are having stupid norms because we have stupid politicians that has been elected by stupid population. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria Salas. Thank you. Uh, Final thoughts, Dean said? Yeah, I think my role is to synthesize. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that question, Dean Mel, no? because it's, uh, it's good that that has been raised here because it's, uh, it's an impression, of course, no? that you have lived with. And I ask in a little sense also uh, that the uh, civil society in the long run people themselves, no, who elect people in power, who eventually exercise constitutional functions, no, um, are actually part of this whole constitutional function. You may not see it, but as mentioned, you vote for somebody, do you think you voted holistically for this person to appreciate the entire gamut of constitutional powers who or he or she would exercise in the long run, including the nomination of members of the Supreme Court, and so forth and so on with the cabinet. So I ask, if at one point you had a very good president, how many can we count? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that president that you had the impression was good for the country also nominated people of the same interest, right? Do you think those who did not vote for that president would have the impression that these people will vote for that president? So when you do studies, and this is a very interesting one because the study mentioned by Dean Mel is of course can something to be read, and we're also doing our own inquiry about it in that sense, uh, follow through, just to see where the Supreme Court itself lies on this impression by the public. Because I'd say that also for a president who's very good, that you don't have any impression about, no, and then select somebody of the same interest, right? So it's interest-based in the long run. I would like, the question is very clear, would you like to have your interest also reflected in the nominee? Of course, naturally. It just so happened that perhaps the impression is this president is good, this president is not, will weaponize or utilize the court for that matter. Which brings me to my last point, a function of leadership. It's a function of leadership, not just in the executive branch, the legislative branch, but the highest court of the land. If you feel you are seeing a leadership right now that perhaps, perhaps, and only perhaps, could leave you with the impression that the court is going to do its best to live up to its mandate in a very impartial way to decide on actions of the two branches of government. You know, the Supreme Court here is very powerful because the decisions of the Supreme Court form part of the law of the land. It participates in a very democratic sense in lawmaking by making pronouncements. And so, where do you knock at the door? Yeah. Exactly, the leadership. If we are able to knock at the doors of the leadership, and even with the Supreme Court now, perhaps, it will be a function of leadership that could sway the impression whether or not this court is going to perform in a manner independent of the two other branches of government. Because the bottom line is, any sitting president would have, in his interest, to have somebody who is familiar. I wish we could pray every day to say that the president is enlightened and the members of the Judicial and Bar Council are also enlightened when it comes to having to nominate. I'd stop short of this as I am with a Judicial Academy. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for our distinguished speakers. Big round of applause. Unfortunately, in as much as we would like to accommodate more of your questions, we don't have enough time anymore. So if you have questions, please just feel free to email the 
organizers. But to the students of the law, uh, it's a reminder to all of us to always be vigilant. But in the words of U.S. versus Door, do not engage in scary loose libel against the government. On that note, may we now call on our Dean of the Ateneo Law School, Dean Joey Hofilenia, for the closing remarks. Um, so on behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University School of Law, we'd like to thank each one of our distinguished speakers, Professor Maria Salas and uh, President Jose Jao Abrantes, and our fellow faculty members who had served as our expert reactors, uh, that's uh, Professor Teddy Kalau and Dean Sedfri Candelaria, all of them for enriching us with their presentations and insights and lectures that touched upon topics certainly of consequence. The articulated aim of, Era of our Erasmus-supported CALESA project is to improve, develop, and modernize higher education systems, such as through seminars of the type that we had just encountered and experienced, and to support cooperation mainly through university cooperation projects of the partner, um, of the partner schools, in which case, in our case, in CALESA, the partner schools being the Universidad de Malaga, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, the Justo University, University College Dublin, University of the Philippines, Ateneo de Zamboanga University, University of San Agustin, the Philippine Judicial Academy, and of course, our Ateneo de Manila University. Through the years that we have been working together, through the global perspectives we have gained from one another, through the appreciation we have derived from a deeper knowledge of each other's universities, law schools, countries, cultures, and people, through the experiences we have shared and through the friendships we have made, there can be little doubt that we have indeed moved more than cooperated with each other and that we have been truly faithful to the path that leads us towards achieving our Kalesa goals. We are therefore delighted to be in the same horse-drawn carriage with all of you in this journey towards becoming wiser, more aware, more relevant, and certainly better friends to each other. So before I just, uh, um, well, let me, let me again just conclude by simply thanking everyone. So thank you. Muchas gracias. Obrigado. Esquericasco. Damo gid salamat. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo lahat. May I, however, ask as we, you know, as, as a final culminating thing that we have uh, tokens for our, uh, our, our, our guest speakers. If I can ask them, uh, Dean Maita will present the, the uh, tokens to our speakers. And as we do that, thank you again very much, everybody. Take care uh, as you journey out. I don't know what the weather is like uh, right now, but again, take care. Uh, in short, for the law students, may pasok po tayo. <laughs> Unless the mayor of Makati suspects.